Okay, great. Good. Yeah, great. So, yeah, it's a few minutes past 10. Why don't we get started here? And I'm sure that more people will continue to join us. Hey, Joe Nathan. Oh, I'm getting a little <clears throat> bit of feedback there. What? Oh, that's the live stream again. I got to figure out how to mute that. Just close it out. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that more people will continue to join us. Um, but why don't we get started here with introductions? Um, and we can just keep them quick um, because we want to make sure that we can stay on schedule and get to all of our business in the morning so that, you know, we'll have plenty of time for lunch, um, plenty of time to hear from all our guest speakers. Um, we've got a lot. Um, yeah, so if you could just say your name, uh, your pronouns, where you're from, um, and let us know, is this your first state Green Party meeting, or um, are you a, a, an experienced uh, state Green Party meeting attendee? Uh, so I'm Dave Schwab. Um, I'm a co-chair of the Wisconsin Green Party. Uh, pronouns are he, him. I'm in Madison, and uh, I've been to uh, many city gatherings before. Um, so I'll just call on people in the order that I see them to keep things moving. So um, with the exception of Joe Nathan Kingfisher, he's uh, a fellow co-chair, will be co facilitating the meeting. Um, so uh, Joe Nathan, why don't you go next? Um, Buju uh, Zibisen is my real name in Ojibwe Moen. It's also my middle name legally from birth. Uh, Joe Nathan, I'm named Joe Nathan from my dad, George, and uh, my dad's dad's dad, Nathan. And um, oh, my last name's Kingfisher, and that is my family can clan spirit, my dotem, uh, the Kingfisher bird. And we reside here in Ashland, Wisconsin. Uh, my pronouns are him and he. And um, I'm very honored and pleased uh, to virtually be with everybody today. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, next up is Tom Rodman. Um, hi, I'm Tom from Bayview. Uh, fairly experienced now with maybe three or four of these gatherings and uh, involved with IT uh, and that's about it. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Patty? Patty Ashby. Um, I'm a member of the team. Um, I'm a membership outreach. It's a little hard to hear you, Patty. Try to speak up. Sorry, um, Patty Ashby, uh, been a member of the Wisconsin Green Party since 2016. I live in the St. Francis Bayview area and I am the um, state um, outreach and membership committee chair. Good to see everybody here. Great. Um, next up is Jake. Jake, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? No. I can't get my camera working. Uh, I'm Jake Schneider. I'm the former treasurer of the Green Party of the United States and Wisconsin Green Party. And uh, I'm in Oshkosh right now. I'm uh, navigating the COVID-19 <laughs> in my hometown near of Fox River Valley. And uh, I'm happy to be here as opposed to six feet under. Great. Um, so next up is Andrea Bilger. Hi, yes, yeah, so I'm Andrea Bilger. I'm from Madison. I uh, was elected as Four Lakes Green Party representative to the coordinating council um, a few months ago. I've been attending Green Party meetings for a couple months more than that. And um, 
Yeah, happy to be here. My first spring gathering. Yes. Great. Um, next up is Andreas. Uh, we can't hear you. Can you unmute? Oh, yeah, sorry. Hi, um, I'm from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, I've been involved with Green Party stuff since about 2014. Um, I just tried to uh, sort of resurrect the, the Kenosha Green Party that was here before. Um, I haven't got much traction with it uh, since the pandemic started, but um, that's about it. Great. Good to see you. Um, then uh, Barbara. Hello. Hey. Uh, I'm Barbara Dahlgren. Uh, I was the co-chair just last year, and I've been uh, helping in the Wisconsin Green Party since uh, 2016. And before that, since 2009, I was helping with the Illinois Green Party. I currently serve as the elections chair and the uh, dispute resolution committee chair. And good to see everybody. Thanks. All right. Um, so next up is Bill. Bill Bryan from Milwaukee. I'm the state treasurer. I got involved in the Greens during the Nader campaign. I've been active off and on since. Dispute resolution. Great. Um, next up is Bruce. Hello, I'm Bruce Hankforth, Wakatomohawk, uh, 5th District, Congressional District, uh, CC member. Uh, I've been with the state party since 1987. All right. Um, next up is Greg. Morning, Greg Banks, co-chair, Greater Milwaukee Green Party. Uh, been to many gatherings over the years. Pass. All right. Um, I don't know, people are jumping around in the list so much. Uh, Jeffrey. Uh, good morning, I'm, I'm Jeff Reese. Um, as far as I can tell, I'm, I'm a mister, um, or he. Um, I'm from Fond du Lac, um, and I've been with the Green Party now. I guess I was pretty much a refugee from... Uh, uh, from the days of, of Bernie Sanders uh, back in 2016. And so, um, come to find out that uh, I probably was a green all along. I just didn't know it. Um, and I was introduced by... Um, uh, Gerald Davidson, who um, is also from Final Light County, but uh, I don't know, for some reason he kind of dropped off. Um, uh, okay. He does go to my church, and so I do stay in touch with him. So, okay, yeah, we're trying to keep these intros quick. Yeah, I guess that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, so next up is uh, Jamie. Oh, hello. I didn't know how many people were going to be here. 
Hey, welcome. Oh yeah, so sorry, if you've just joined, we're just going around doing a quick round of introductions. You could just tell us your name, your pronouns, where you're from, and is this your first uh, Green Party state gathering or have you, uh, have you been around? Um, my name is Jamie, I'm from Stevens Point, and this is my first gathering, though I've been a member of the party for a long time, I just haven't said hi. Great, welcome. Cool, so um, let's see. Uh, next up is Pam. Hi, I'm Pam Richard, I'm from Milwaukee. I was recruited by Tom Ryan. Anything uh, I before with the Progressive Democrats of America, which I still have hope for, but not the Democrats. So I'm glad to be in the Green Party. Great, welcome. Um, and then Sam. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, he him pronouns uh, from Madison. I'm the Congressional District 2 uh, rep to the Cong uh, Coordinating Council. Uh, this is, I think, my third state gathering. Pass. Cool. Let's see. And is there anyone? Uh, oh, wait. Yes. Uh, sorry, just checking to see. Uh, Carrie? Thanks, Dave. Um, hi, uh, I'm Carrie Bruss. I live in the Waukesha County area. Um, have been um, a Green Party member for about a year. And this is my second gathering. I attended the fall gathering prior. Uh, thank you. Thanks. And someone just joined with the name iPhone. Oh, it looks like Mary. Mary, uh, you're muted. Yes, good morning, everybody. Yes, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mary. Um, you just give us a quick intro and we're doing name and pronouns where you're from and is this your first state gathering? It's my third state gathering. My name is Mary Sanderson. I grew up in Columbus. I live in DeForest and um, I'm going to turn off my camera pretty soon and listen because I have to go outside. Very happy to be able to attend. Great. Um, okay. So I think um, everyone has gotten the chance to introduce themselves. If not, then please let us know in the chat. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that more people will be joining us as the day goes on given people's different schedules. Um, but, you know, from now on, we'll ask folks to introduce themselves in the chat uh, so that we can keep things moving without too many interruptions. Uh, so again, I'm Dave Schwab. Uh, Joe Nathan, ZB Kingfisher and I are the co-chairs. Uh, we'll be facilitating this meeting. And we just want to go over a you know, quick orientation and ground rules. Um, and before we do that, I just wanna say one more time, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, want to, you know, acknowledge that we are on Native American land, um, first of all. Um, so let's go to the, uh, the co-chair, or sorry, the uh, ground rules. Um, so first of all, we'll be facilitating the meeting using a modified consensus process. What that means is that we strive to find consensus on decisions. So we want to make sure that um, everyone has the chance to ask questions, raise concerns, um, and discuss decisions. Um, if we can all come to an agreement on decisions, that's great, and we can reach consensus. Um, if there are, you know, any unresolved concerns, uh, then 
we can um, move to a, a voting process where um, we require a 60% yes vote for uh, decisions to be made. Uh, typically, uh, most of the decisions that we make at these gatherings are sort of known and advertised in advance um, at the spring gathering. Um, we don't usually, well, in, in an odd year, we don't usually have elections, um, but we, we will, for example, be um, discussing and deciding on bylaws and amendments today. So um, there will be a ballot sent out to all uh, dues paying members in good standing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, so the actual vote on that won't be happening during the meeting, but it will use the same voting process. Um, so, but anyway, the, the point I was making is that um, we probably won't be holding many votes during the actual meeting today, um, but that's just to let people know what our process is. Um, please make sure that your username in the Zoom is your name so that we know who's here and who's participating. Um, if you would like to speak, we use what we call the stack. Um, and to get on the stack, please type the word stack in the chat. Um, please don't raise your hand. Um, that makes it a lot more difficult to try to keep track of who's trying to get on the stack and you know who raised their hand first. If you just type stack in the chat, it makes it a lot easier. Um, so then you are able to speak um, and you know we try to let people speak until they're finished. Um, yeah, you know, just ask people to try to keep their comments brief and try not to sort of repeat points that you've already made or, uh, you know, that other people have made. Then you can say pass or over when you're finished talking um, so that we don't accidentally interrupt. Otherwise, it can be difficult to know when exactly someone is finished. So just remember to say pass or over when you're done. Um, we use a progressive stack which basically means we'll, we'll try to call on people who haven't spoken yet. Um, and, you know, we try to have sort of like a circle, circular discussion, try not to get into a lot of back and forth or anything like that. Um, so we have a, a code of conduct that just has some basic ground rules to keep things respectful and productive. Um, so I'll post the link to that. Folks can take a quick look at the code of conduct and, um, you know, please make sure to, to follow, uh, those ground rules so we can have a good meeting. Um, and then finally our meetings and everything we do, uh, is conducted by our bylaws. Uh, so you can take a look at those. Um, and if you have any questions about the decision-making process or anything like that, uh, it should all be answered there in the bylaws. But everything that I just said is, is pretty much uh, the basics that you need to know to participate in this meeting and know what's going on. Um, so, uh, Joe Nathan, do you have anything to add? Um, I just, um, I respect everybody and I hope we all can choose to keep, uh, our language, um, as positive and realistic as possible. And, um, when there's needed input criticism that it is, uh, for a positive result. That's it. Pass. Thanks. Um, okay. So. Does anyone have any questions right now about the ground rules or anything that, that we've gone over so far? 
Remember, if you have a question, you can just type stack into the chat. Okay, not seeing any. Great, so why don't we keep moving? Um, so the, the first thing that we have up on the agenda is reports. So uh, first we'll, we'll hear from the officers, uh, then we'll hear from the committees, uh, then we'll hear from the chapters. Um, so these should be quick reports of, you know, basically two to three minutes. And if anyone then has any uh, burning questions, then uh, they can ask. Um, but again, we do want to, you know, try to get through the reports expeditiously uh, so we can get to the bylaws discussion at 11 and, you know, hopefully um, get through everything that needs to be discussed in time for our lunch break so we can keep things moving. So, um, okay, yeah, and if, if more people join, then please use the chat to, excuse me, introduce yourself. Um, all right, so uh, we can start with the co-chair's report. So um, since the fall gathering, um, you know, we've had a lot of uh, really positive activity in the state party. Um, in addition to new members joining, uh, we've had a lot of activity with our committees. Um, all seven of our state committees have been meeting regularly, um, many with new members. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about those committees later. Um, we have been moving forward in terms of identifying organizers for congressional district uh, chapters. Um, and we have, uh, you know, generally, I think been doing a lot of uh, solid fundamental like behind the scenes work in terms of building a state party. Um, we've uh, started keeping a better track of our dues paying membership. Uh, so, so we can aim to grow our membership. Um, and yeah, I think that's basically the overview of how things are going. Um, so I'll pass it over to Joe Nathan. Well, that's a, a good summary of it. Uh, we've certainly um, uh, wrangled out some issues this uh, uh, term and um, uh, made progress where the COVID virus has made it difficult. So, um, oh, Dave, last time you gave uh, uh, a nice delivery of issues. Are you planning to do that again at some point in the agenda th this uh, meeting? It's a good question. Um, I, th you know, I was, we have so many great guest speakers today that I thought, you know, maybe I should talk less and just try to, you know, get through our business in the morning so we can hear more from them. Uh, that was my basic thinking. You know, I'm, All right. well, I'm with that afternoon for political discussion. I know that that is kind of the more interesting part, but um, my thinking was, you know, let's get through the, the nitty gritty stuff and, you know, save more time for political discussion in the afternoon, if that's okay so, with people. Yeah, I'm, I'm with that. I, I had um, uh, a number of remarks for a recorded posterity, and, and if I have the chance to say that later this afternoon, um, you know, I have five, ten minutes worth of stuff. Uh, however, uh, our guests take precedent, so uh, let's move on. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, next up, um, if we could hear a treasurer's report. So I'll turn it over to Bill and Patty. Patty or Tom, if you could uh, 
bring up the financial performance sheet so people could look at how things have transpired over the last few months. That would be good. Hopefully that'll happen. Next. It's not happening. Uh, Patty, are you getting... I'm, I'm getting ready to share my screen. Okay. Uh, okay. The uh, pause here. No worries. Um, so can you see it, Bill? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Everything's fine here. Okay. So um, the first thing you'll notice, I hope, is under income. Um, dues and donations, what our members and supporters uh, contribute is our only source of income. And I went, just went back and looked over the last year and we've been averaging um, between four and $500 a month in dues and donations. And that sum has allowed us to cover all of our um, operate monthly operating expenses plus it's given us a little bit of um, additional financial cushion to be able to uh, give contributions to the, our some of our candidates in, in in a targeted fashion so it shows here that we gave uh, six hundred dollars to candidates um, in this in this period which was from the first of November till the end of March and I can report that we've given around a thousand uh, in the course of the uh, the spring campaign um, our finances have been amazingly stable and uh, we for the last couple of years our total assets that you'll see at the bottom have hovered around fifteen thousand and so far, um, things have gone well. We want to increase our dues paying membership. That is our lifeline. Uh, we are a membership based organization and we can do so much more with more resources and with more members. So I'll end on that note. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Bill and Patty. Okay. So uh, next up would be our uh, committee reports. Um, so going with alphabetical order, um, we can start with the communications committee. Um, so I'm the chair of the communications committee. And I'm happy to report that we um, have new members who have been contributing a lot. We've been able to increase our output on social media, on uh, email, our website. Um, we've sent out uh, newsletters in the winter uh, and spring as well. Um, we are currently working on updating our media list and media outreach uh, capacity. Um, we've been discussing updates to our website and to our graphics. Um, and yeah, as well as the use of sort of new uh, tech tools and social media platforms. Um, so yeah, overall things have been going really well. And um, yeah, I'll pass with that. And you know, again, if there are any questions and people can raise them in the chat. Um, okay. So um, next up would be the uh, elections committee. Hello everyone. Um, we have had a lot go on in the elections committee since the last time we met together. We held a great campaign school on December 19th that is being made uh, widely usable on YouTube. 
and so that um, we can really spread those messages on how to actually run a campaign and make that available for common people um, rather than just you know elites being able to run for office because that's um, a, a major goal of the Green Party. Um, we raised nearly $500 to support our local candidates this spring. We endorse 13 candidates in total, uh, most of them in Madison. Uh, they had the, their common council elections and five of them uh, won their races or won re-election. Brian Benford, Patrick Heck, Juliana Bennett, Nikki Conklin and Grant Foster all uh, are on are serving on the um, the Common Council of Madison, which is fantastic. We also had an openly socialist candidate running in Milwaukee, Alex Brower. Um, he got forty five percent of the vote as the first socialist uh, up for election since um, I think in fifty years was um, was the, the stat that we got on that. Um, so we're not quite there yet, but he. I, I can't think of a, a better um, campaign that was knocking on doors. I think we probably knocked everybody's door in his district three times. <laughs> um, it was a, an incredible energetic campaign. And we also had Jim O'Neill uh, for school board in uh, Baraboo, and he chose to run a write-in campaign. Didn't make it this time, but we were very pleased to have so many great candidates running this year. Um, we also, just this last week, presented two advisory questions at the Wisconsin Conservation Congress, and they appeared at least on three county ballots, which um, I think qualifies as a shotgun proposal, meaning that it's going to get a lot more um, weight added to it at the Conservation Congress. Uh, one of those was uh, a Green New Deal proposal so that the Conservation Congress uh, will hopefully be supportive of the Green New Deal. And the second one was about restructuring the Conservation Congress for um, representation by population to make it more democratic. So um, that was really exciting. And also our own Barb Eisenberg in Milwaukee County presented a couple of more about um, hunting and um, the cruelty in hunting. So we we're very pleased to have so many things going on in the elections committee. We're always looking for new members and we're always looking for candidates. Next year is a huge election year. So we would love to, to see people stepping up for um, all four of our statewide positions, governor, lieutenant governor, and especially secretary and treasurer. Um, we always think of the top of the ticket as most important, but really secretary and treasurer are very important to the Green Party in Wisconsin. Um, and so if you also, I'll put my um, email address in the chat if you are interested in joining the elections committee and we would love to see you at the next meeting, which um, I'll have to think about when that is because we got a little bit off track when we were doing all those knocking of doors in the last couple of weeks. So thank you so much for your time and hopefully we can have a great uh, 2022 election year as well. Awesome, thanks Barb. Um, great, so next up would be the dispute resolution committee. I can also report on that. Um, since the dispute resolution committee was formed just a few years ago, we have heard two disputes, which um, that in my eyes, that means that we get along pretty well on a normal uh, basis. Um, but we have decided to become a standing committee so that we can help suggest policy and procedure to the coordinating council. Um, and therefore solidify in writing the kinds of things that we do on a normal basis. So we've already started doing this by solidifying that procedure in writing. Um, for example, how we decide to present agendas. Um, it's something that we do all the time, but we just never wrote it down. 
And so these things are really important to make sure that we're pretty standard across the state. Everybody knows how things are supposed to be. And then everybody is, um, you know, the party runs a little bit more smoothly. So that's pretty much what I've got to report on that. And I'll pass, thanks. Great, thanks Barb. Okay, uh, so next up will be the finance committee. Um, you know, if there is anything to report that wasn't already discussed in the treasurer's report. Um, I can report just briefly. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm having yes. a little trouble with my mic today. Um, just to say that um, on the elections uh, reporting, the Wisconsin um, uh, election reporting, we have to submit uh, reports every time we make donations to the candidates, and um, also two reports per year. And I've been working with. Um, Bill on, on finance because the um, reports that we submit to the um, ethics committee, um, the contributions have to uh, uh, reconcile with our bank account. And so um, we've been working together a lot to make sure that our finances um, are in order and that our reports are correct. So just, just that, um, it's been kind of challenging, but we're, we're continuing to um, time on that. Okay. okay, great. Thanks, Patty. Um, so the next up would be the IT committee. Okay, uh, let's see here. I think I'll share my screen and keep this to like a couple minutes. Can people see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, um, I think Sam Chance instituted this uh, written report thing, so that helps me. Um, the ru the routine stuff that I do uh, or that we do, um, supporting the streaming and these meetings and just video meetings in general, um, maintaining uh, a library of recordings. So we have recordings of video, almost all the meetings. Um, and then I've been doing quite a lot of one-to-one -one training. Uh, I think Sam Chance included this. Uh, so is that the live stream echo again? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, all right. And then uh, yeah, onboarding new people, training them on Nation Builder, which is our website and our constituent resource management system. Um, and then, you know, uh, we so in in general though I, uh, it's just been ongoing support of that website and the database and uh, assisting people and creating call lists and for example today working on the uh, uh, a programmatic way to come up with uh, a list of members in good standing so those are some uh, overviews there's ongoing issues about um, bugs and problems in the database and working with the software vendor, which is Nation Builder. Um, and uh, Thomas Ward and I have been working together. I've been trained, I've trained him on Nation Builder and I've trained Sam Chance, hoping that Sam will continue to help out. So I'm right about at two minutes. I'll just cut it short there and certainly would welcome any help from uh, IT experts. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Tom. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Okay. So next up will be the platform and policy committee with, uh, Bruce and Joe Nathan as the co-chairs. Well, my main takeaway from, uh, our, our good conversation, we had more participation in good conversations is, uh, uh, connecting with uh, similar green movements and uh, how to uh, bring people in and, uh, uh, you know, extend ourselves uh, to be more coordinated with uh, 
like-minded people in the world. And um, I, I, I think there's some consensus that there is some need for policy and platform updating uh, the, for, for all the good discussion, we haven't made formal decisions on what to update. And with that, I, I'll ask Bruce uh, to input and uh, thank you very much, Pass. Okay, yeah, I confirm that. We've been uh, meeting regularly for several months now, which is a, a huge improvement over a very spotty record of both meetings and uh, the number of people that have attended. I mean, like last year at this time, meetings which, which were basically just conversations between one or two people. So uh, we're looking at ways of uh, improving the platform. We have no specific proposals or changes at the moment, but I think some good things are in work. In the works. So. I'll pass on that. All right, thank you. Cool, so um, I'm trying to, th I believe that gets us through our uh, various committee reports. Um, we got all of them, right? Sorry, Dave. Membership outreach. Oh, I'm so sorry, yeah, membership outreach. Uh, so um, the membership outreach committee meets the first Thursday of every month, and we're currently a seven-member committee. We welcomed Sam Chance as a new committee member last November. Um, so the prime, we are tasked with managing the state member database, responding to member and non-member communications, um, in coordination with our communications committee, and um, also building the membership base. Wisconsin. We also um, provide support in the formation of new um, Over the last few months, we've been working with the IT committee on data management, and we've run two membership recruitment and renewal campaigns this year. And we also coordinate the organizing of the fall and spring gathering. Um, and as you all know, because the Green Party doesn't accept any corporate support and we rely, as Bill said earlier, on um, contributions and, and membership dues, it's really key um, that we work to grow the membership base in, um, in Wisconsin particularly. So we need everybody's support. And I think um, most everybody in the meeting right now are current members, so thank you for that. Um, if you're not, please um, consider, you know, joining or renewing your membership today. And I'll put the um, the link to contribute. I think it's already in the chat, but I'll put it in again. And um, I'd also just like to say thank you to the the committee members um, for their time over these last few months uh, and their commitment to growing the Wisconsin Green Party. So thanks for all your great work and time. And um, we, we need help. We need um, uh, new committee members who have a few um, minutes, a few, you know, an hour or so a month to um, help with updating the member database, texting and calling to connect with prospective members and um, also new and exi existing members. So if you even have just a few mi uh, minutes, that would be, um, it would be really helpful if you'd consider volunteering. And um, lastly, if you're interested in maybe starting a local chapter, um, you can contact me or one of the co-chairs and we'll provide you with information, information on how to get a chapter started in your area. Um, I'll put my contact information in the chat. And just lastly to say we have Green Party t-shirts. So if you'd like to make a uh, if you don't already have one and you'd like to make a little extra contribution of $20, I'd love to send you a Green Party t-shirt. So um, thanks everybody and I hope you enjoy your day. Thanks, Patty. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for your great work. And um, as Patty mentioned and, and Bill and everyone else, we uh, don't take, you know, a single penny of corporate money, and we never will. 
were run completely on, uh, you know, contributions from our membership. So please become a dues paying member uh, now if you aren't already or uh, renew your dues or maybe consider becoming a monthly uh, dues paying member. Um, it all helps a lot. And if you're interested in joining uh, one of these committees, uh, committees are where most of our work gets done. And um, I put the link to the committees page in the chat so you can see a little bit more about what each of them does. If you have any questions, let us know. And you, know, you can submit your interest to join one of our committees if, um, if you're a member and you're interested in, uh, in uh, getting involved. Um, and the t-shirts, you can um, basically talk to, to Patty and Bill about that. Um, and I'll just mention, I, I'm wearing one of our new Wisconsin Green Party t-shirts. So you can kind of see the design here. Um, they're very cool. And very comfortable too. Uh, so, all right, great. So uh, the last reports that we have are for our local chapters. Right now we have accredited chapters in Greater Milwaukee and uh, Four Lakes Green Party in Dane County. Um, so why don't we start with the uh, Greater Milwaukee Green Party? Um, so would that be Mike or Greg? Both of whom are muted. Okay, I was having trouble unmuting, sorry. Um, so yeah, I'll share my screen and zip right through this. Okay, let's see, I guess I won't share my screen, here we go. Okay. So uh, I can't see it at the top, but you can see it. Oh, there you go. Since our fall uh, 2020 state gathering, um, you can see my email there and my name. If you have any questions or comments, you can either send me a Facebook message by my name or email me. Um, let's see, this is... So first thing we did was in December, we looked at our annual goals and acknowledged our shortcomings and successes. Our voting members do this stuff. Everything that's pretty much on this list is done by our voting members. Uh, and then we developed in January four new goals. One of them is development. Uh, second one was voter suppression access as a priority. Uh, Third one was Milwaukee Anti-Racist Green New Deal. And the fourth was lobby to repeal the authorization of use of military force. And uh, two of our voting members are serving or supporting Wisconsin Conservation Congress in a very strong way. We have four committees, membership, IT, which is the longest running committee that we have, elections and outreach, and they're all very strong committees. Uh, one of our members does Green Social every Monday, and that's been great through the pandemic, support for folks. We voted uh, about six years ago to do team building team skills, five minutes of that at each of our monthly meetings. And been very consistent with that. Uh, our voting members also support these coalition, coalition partners. So the Poor People's Army, Woe's Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility, now is Wisdom, uh, 350 Milwaukee, which is a global warming issues thing. Uh, Democratic Socialists of America, we work with them. Wisconsin Cannabis Advocates, which used to be 
southeastern Wisconsin normal, and the Wars Coalition, and Wisconsin for Safe Technology, which is 5G issues. Uh, I might have forgotten somebody, but uh, just let me know if I did. And I'll fix it. Uh, we participated in two elections since November, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction and Alex Brower for Milwaukee School Board and Barbara reported on those. We have three of our members that represent us on the National Committee um, and they report back to us. And five of our members also serve on, serve the Green Party in leadership positions with the Wisconsin Green Party. Thanks, pass. Great, thanks, Ray. Awesome, so uh, next up is the Four Lakes Green Party. So I'm gathering that to me and I'm sorry, I'm still kind of <laughs> realizing what my role is here. So uh, I'll just summarize what uh, what is in my head and please fill in, Dave, if you feel there's something significant missing. So. Um, we have been, well, uh, we, we certainly spent a fair amount of time on, on our own elections, but especially on the um, candidates, the dozen ca candidates that we endorsed for um, uh, Alder. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, five of those won their seats, which is, which is good. There were some disappointments, but, but overall we were happy to have five elected and, and leading up to that, we, um, we invited the candidates to speak at one, our, one of our meetings and then we actually had a forum um, where we had uh, them all answer five questions and uh, give their opening and closing statements. It was, uh, it was very interesting to me anyway, to hear uh, all their stands and there were some, some difference, a lot of, a lot of uh, um, common, common views, obviously, but, but some differences. We've also focused on, uh, yeah, on the F-35 issue, preventing their arrival in Madison and that, that's about where I'm gonna stop. <laughs> you, if, would you like to add some things? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, you hit many of the highlights. Um, we also did recently vote to for new chapter bylaws. Um, so that's good. Um, starting to get a little more formal structure into our local party. Um, and I'll also just mention that we, in addition to the uh, no F-35 campaign, we've also partnered with the um, the uh, coalition that is working against uh, Dane County spending $150 million for a new jail. Um, sort of similar to the, the work that the Milwaukee Greens are doing. Um, yeah, great. Well, yeah. thanks for that report. Thanks everyone for all your reports. Um, we did that in just about the time that we had. So, um, yeah, we are amazingly on schedule so far. Uh, does anyone have any burning questions about any of these reports? Um, we can maybe get to a question or two real quick before we move on to the discussion of the bylaws amendments. I have a quick question if nobody else does. Go for it. Uh, so we've mostly been socially distant and, and not meeting in person, but I do have about a billion buttons at my house. If anybody would like buttons, um, I would be happy to arrange something. I forgot what we were selling them for, but um, like if somebody wanted a whole pack of buttons, we could arrange something. Um, it's kind of up to the membership committee though. I think we were selling like six buttons for $3, something like that. 
Thanks, Patty. All right. So if there aren't any more questions, then we can move on to the next agenda item. Um, and after that is lunch. So um, yeah, if we can continue being ahead of schedule, then we can uh, get our lunch and then get back to our to hear our guest speakers and everything else that we've got planned for the afternoon. Um, okay. So uh, if folks have looked on our website uh, where we have the um, where we have the uh, bylaws. Oh, Bruce, did you have a question before we proceed here? Well, it looks like we do not have a quorum. Uh, so I move that we table any discussion or action or voting on any of these bylaw proposals until the fall gathering. So to respond to that, the, the vote will actually be happened by sending out ballots to all the members. Um, so we can't vote, conduct business at this meeting without a quorum and that's part of our procedure for uh, passing bylaws. So to hold a vote would be in violation of our bylaws. So uh, I second so, the motion. Okay, so, the, so we're not holding the vote during the meeting. It's not just going to be the people at the meeting who are able to vote. It, the ballot goes out to all the members. And, you know, so then people will be able to vote. Even that is questionable, Dave, because that's also in our bylaws. You have to be present at a meeting to vote. Look at the bylaws, okay? Okay, so I see that Bill and Sam are on stack. Go ahead, Bill. Bill? Muted, oh, yes. The uh, proposed bylaws changes have been publicly available for a, a very long time. We discussed them at the uh, fall gathering. Um, we're discussing them again at the spring gathering and all members will have an opportunity to vote on them, uh, all dues paying members. Um, we are in the middle of a pandemic, so that has been a consideration on how we've organized our meetings, uh, but I think we've pretty effectively utilized uh, the technology and what's been available for us to have an ongoing and very elaborate discussion on the proposed bylaws changes. I think they've had a very fair public airing. And um, I think um, it's entirely in order for that, for us to submit them to the membership. Pass. All right, uh, so next up we have Sam, then Patty, then Carrie. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I mean, I just wonder as a matter of precedence, um, you know, how, sorry, uh, go, go to the next person. My teapot's about to explode. <laughs> okay. Uh, so next up is Patty. I see Barb has also got on the stack. Um, just a suggestion as we're um, running ahead of schedule, would we be able to move this discussion toward the end of the day after um, the speakers? Because I'm, ex I'm guessing that we'll have a lot more people joining the meeting in the afternoon. Pass. Okay, uh, next up is Carrie, then Barb, and I'll put myself on stack. I guess um, I, I think uh, I agree with um, Bruce that a meeting is, uh, there's very clear, our bylaws are very clear about what constitute a meeting. And pandemic or no, this is our meeting. And we do not have quorum. I 
suggest that we move to table. Um, I also have another quest, uh, a concern about this, um, one of the proposals. Um, the text has changed from the time it was first read to what's now being present on the, on the website. That alone tells me that there has not been a, a, a dual reading because there's two different, they're different. The text has changed. That is another concern that we should address. Pass. Okay, so if you can maybe put in the chat how you believe that the text has changed. Um, so I see that's, okay, so Sam wants to get back on the stack, then Barb, then me, then Bill. Uh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I, I guess I just wonder um, historically how, how strictly we've held to this um, idea of uh, quorum at meetings. Um, I don't know that we had um, a quorum present at uh, the last uh, spring gathering where we voted on our um, presidential primary uh, nomination. Um, you know, I mean, it seems to me like this is coming up pretty recently um, in a pretty transparent attempt to just prevent us from having a discussion um, and a vote that we've um, known we were going to have for a long time. Um, yeah, so I think this is kind of, um, <laughs> I'll pass. Okay. Um, so Barb. Um, I'm pretty sure we do have quorum. Uh, according to section five, a quorum is 15% of the members in good standing. I'm pretty sure we had 110 members in good standing and we have 17 people here. So doing the math, that's 15%. Pass. Okay. Thanks, Barb. Um, yeah, um, so, so Tom, next, Tom Stack. Next up is me. Um, yeah, and if Tom, if you could put in the chat along with everyone else, because with people getting on the stack, it makes it easier to keep track of um, where we're at. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, responding to what Patty was saying, you know, to to change the agenda now, um, you know, would basically require taking away time from our guest speakers. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't think any of us want to do that. Um, that would mean, you know, not being able to hear from the folks who we invited. Um, so it wouldn't be good for them. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if, um, that's what folks want either. Um, you know, as for the issue of quorum, are we uh, above 15%? Are we just below it? Um, that would be relevant if the decision was going to be made by the people um, who are here right now, but that's not the case. Um, right now is just the part of the agenda where we are going to be discussing the, or continuing the discussion that we began at the fall gathering. Um, so the proposed bylaws amendments were brought to the fall gathering for discussion. They were discussed. People were able to provide feedback and ask questions. Um, and then you know, at that time, we agreed to bring the amendments to the spring gathering uh, for a decision. So at this point, uh, we have one more chance for discussion, uh, for people to ask questions, uh, you know, raise any concerns. Um, and then uh, at, the, at the end of the gathering, uh, we will send out a, a uh, ballot to all members in good standing um, 
which is the same as we uh, made decisions at the last spring gathering. It's the same as we made decisions at the fall gathering. Um, and that's how we have decided to make decisions at today's spring gathering. So at that point, quorum does become an issue. Uh, if less than, excuse me, if less than 15% of our members in good standing were to vote, then we would not have quorum on that vote. And, um, you know, we couldn't consider it a legitimate decision. Um, if at least 15% of people, uh, of our members in good standing do vote on, on the decision, then we have quorum. Uh, so, I, you know, that's the procedural issue. And, um, you know, I think we should proceed as planned and, you know, not get derailed here by, uh, you know, sudden new interpretations of our bylaws, uh, you know, on the morning of the meeting. Um, all right, so I will, let's see, uh, I think, uh, I'm trying to see who was after me. Um, I think we had Bill. Then um, looks like Bill, Bruce, Patty, Carrie, Tom, uh, Joe Nathan. So uh, Joe Nathan has not spoken yet. Um, so why don't we go to Joe Nathan next? Um, I keep my order in the stack, please. Sure. Okay. So next up is Bill. I support Patty's suggestion. We have a discussion now on the substance of the bylaws uh, proposed change. And then at the end of the meeting, we return to that, ask for any additional discussion, and take note of the fact that three additional people have showed up. Pass. All right. Um, next up is Bruce. Okay, in regard to the uh, idea of historical precedent, yes, on many occasions we've had statewide meetings when I was co chair and other people, uh, there's been some real lean times in the state party, good times, lean times. And we still get together, but sometimes it's only five or six people and I know where is that quorum. And I don't remember, and I know for sure, we never passed a bylaw amendment with six people, okay? Uh, did we pass a bylaw amendment last spring? Anybody answer that? Did we pass one last fall? Last fall, we used the, the total vote of the membership mainly to fill the coordinating council. Last spring, it was a matter of selecting a, a candidate. Our bylaws are very clear. Article 12, section one, the bylaws may be amended at any membership meeting by decision of the members present. We don't have a quorum. And it does not allow for us either to do a mail vote or do an online vote. It has to be present, okay? It's in our bylaws. You wanna bring a bylaw change next fall to change that, fine. But I think until then, we should simply table this. What's the problem with tabling this? It might enable us to get a, a listserv going so there could be a little bit more than a fairly insular discussion that we've had of these proposals. Uh, and I think we need a lot more discussion because there's no, no process for implementing them, okay? Well, what we do, there's like a paragraph, but it's pretty big. It doesn't say who can accuse somebody of uh, misconduct or uh, what their rights are in terms of uh, appealing a decision and who makes the decision anyway, the DRC? Well, I guess it's the whole membership, but 
um, that needs to be fleshed out a whole lot more before we start finding ways to, to punish more people. And, uh, you know, we have such a huge party, you know, all 127 of us, you know. I mean, there's been times when we've had over 100, I mean, over 300. So it's not like uh, we should be kicking people out, you know. We need all the help we can get. So again, I have moved that this be tabled until uh, the fall. And if we go forward, um, it'll simply be illegal. It'll be against our bylaws. And uh, go ahead, try to prove me wrong. Okay, it sounds like you're done. So, um, okay. Uh, so I'm trying to see. So it was Bill, Bruce, Patty. Uh, Patty? All right, you can take me off the stack. Oh, okay. Uh, Carrie? Um, actually, um, thank you, um, but it looks like Barb clarified my point about what is quorum. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tom. Okay, um, I mean, I empathize with the idea of this coming across as, you know, sort of obstructionist or whatever, but nonetheless, there are, you know, there are details and I echo what Bruce said you know, what's wrong with getting a, you know, clearly a part of us wants to have a discussion over this. And uh, some of us did not become, uh, I didn't become awake to some of the issues until after the bulk of the discussion had happened. Um, it, it, but uh, in addition, yeah, so it, with respect to these rules, um, uh, it was brought up just recently to me that, uh, you know, the voting, the voter list should be the people that are at the physical meeting or the virtual meeting as a, so, so the, I'm, I guess I'm literally questioning the definition of quorum and I would like somebody to sit down and I mean, that should be in writing somewhere. So it's quorum based on a total of the people, um, is, is the, um, the voter list, the potential voter list, uh, cut down to the just the people that are in the meeting, or isn't it? And I don't think that's resolved. Um, let me see. And as far as um, what we've done in the past, just because we've done something in the past, I mean, we could be uh, unconsciously doing a practice that's not following the bylaws. If we wake up and find out we're not following our own rules, then we should correct them. Um, and here's another issue. If we make this voting period extend over multiple days and people, you know, are we going to, in, in the scenario where we don't require that they be in the meeting, um, or uh, even if they are in the meeting, they could, the number could change because the people could renew their membership. So the, the current number that's on the list could go up if we, there are about a dozen or so people with bad e a bad email address. If we can get the correct email address, then the, 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 the total eligible uh, number of voters goes up. So this whole thing is kind of a moving target uh, and but anyhow, I'm going back to, I think that the, the definition of um, who's eligible to vote is pretty important. Pass. All right. Um, so next up we have, uh, okay, uh, Joe Nathan, then Bill, then Sam, then Andrea, 
myself on as well. Okay, so Jenny, I think go ahead. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to say that I'm, I'm getting fairly tired of uh, Green Party business becoming sort of like a force of personality, like when Bruce disagrees or doesn't like what's happening, then he gets really loud and forceful and it agitates a lot. So I just want to repeat, you know, can we please focus on positive and um, my, my basic understanding of this whole issue has been really clear. It's it just the issue has progressed through months and years of discussion. And it's only recently in recent days that there's been a big blowback on doing this uh, conversation or vote. And I'm really getting very tired of sort of like grabbing policy and, um, you know, just grabbing um, quotes that aren't really defined. And, and I agree with Tom Rodman. I'd really like quorum to be defined pass. Okay. Uh... So Bill says he already spoke. Uh, so next up is Sam and Andrea. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah. So I mean, it it really just strikes me like we're we're having the these procedural arguments at last minute when there was a lot of time for people to think about what quorum is or think you know that this is going to be an issue it got i mean the first it got raised to my awareness was like last night at 10 p.m um and the other thing that you know and so it just seems like we're trying to avoid having the discussion that ostensibly people are saying well we should have more people involved in the discussion you know so let's not have it at all um the other thing is that, you know, now I'm hearing these arguments that we should decrease the number of eligible voters. And, you know, I mean, I think that if you're agreeing in good standing, then you should be eligible to, to vote on a bylaw change, regardless of whether or not you, um, you can make it today or any other day, or if you have the stomach um, for these, for these discussions. Um, I mean, I know that there are many Greens that, um, you know, they have an opinion on this, but they're not here because, you know, they're afraid that they're going to get exposed to some like really toxic language in the course of the discussion. You know, I mean, I don't know. It's just like we should be trying to increase member participation increase the number of people who vote on a bylaw change we shouldn't be trying to decrease it or decrease the number of people who can participate in in the discussion you know based on on their ability to attend a meeting um this this strikes me as extremely anti-democratic um it, it it strikes me as just like i said before transparently using procedure to stifle a discussion and you know, I'm not going to try to prove anybody wrong or, or go and dig into the bylaws and try to get some technicalities on people. But I mean, to me, this is a matter of integrity and like <laughs> pass. Okay. Um, so Andrea is next. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this troubles me uh, as a as a rule follower. If the bylaws do say that the vote on bylaws has to be people who are present, that you know it's troubling to me. I, I can see good reasons not to do that, but um, but it's troubling that that's present. But on the other hand, in terms of you know how you change that, especially you know in a pandemic world, how do you uh, or you know I realize there's Zoom, but 
but you know, you can easily imagine this all being hijacked by a bunch of people who are officially members who just refuse to participate and nothing can ever get done, right? You can never have quorum and what happens then? You can't change the bylaws to make it to, to allow the Green Party to be productive in the presence of it, despite members who don't attend. Um, so that really seems potentially disastrous. Uh, you know, you could really be in a catch-22 where you can't make decisions, including you can't make decisions to alter the way you make decisions. Um, so I find this very troubling. I'm not sure I, I know what my uh, conclusions are, but I just thought I'd bring those issues up because they're troubling me. Pass. Okay, so I'm next up. Um, so yeah, you know, to um, sort of build on some of the points that have been made. I know that there are people who were, you know, wanted to attend today, would be here today, but they had to work right now. Um, you know, considering the theme that we chose for today is a party for working people, um, you know, a, a, you know, overly strict interpretation saying that, no, you have to be physically present at the meeting in order to have a vote. Um, that's, you know, explicitly classist. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it, it would be uh, completely counter to the spirit of today uh, to say that, you know, only members who are physically present at, uh, you know, the, this chosen time are able to vote. Um, so that's one matter, but, you know, that's, to me, that's not an issue because I believe the, the basic question here is, should we allow all our members to vote as we have been doing, um, you know, pretty much uh, as much as possible since we became a dues paying membership organization. It's very clear what you need to do to have a vote in the organization is to be a dues paying member in good standing. Um, so that's one thing. And, uh, you know, also, yeah, just to echo the point, you know, this has been uh, public information for months. We, we discussed the proposed bylaws amendments at the fall gathering. And, uh, you know, they were in the newsletter. They have been, you know, the recording of that discussion has been up for a while. Um, you know, people could have, uh, you know, sent us uh, emails and, uh, you know, talked with our social media accounts. But I haven't seen a single question, uh, you know, coming in about this. And um, nor have I heard any, you know, objections uh, from the folks raising objections to the process today until I think three days ago. Uh, so it's really, you know, a question of process, uh, you know, if you want to talk process, then, okay, so we've been planning this for months, very openly and publicly, and, you know, doing our best to solicit feedback while still moving things forward, um, you know, and we want every member of the organization to have a vote versus okay, are we going to sort of uh, interpret our rules in a very narrow way uh, to prevent anything from happening, to uh, continually uh, block and obstruct uh, any sort of decisions from being made? Um, and are we going to uh, raise these objections at the last minute uh, in order to prevent people who have been uh, doing the work and trying to move things forward in order pr to prevent, uh, you know, any any sort of um, actual democratic process to happen, and in order to prevent all the people who couldn't be here today, all the people who are working right now, uh, from even having a vote, and um, yeah, so uh, 
that's that's how I see things right now. Um, and all I'm saying is, you know, let's you know, continue the process that that most of us have agreed on, and uh, let's let's give all of our members a vote. Um, pass. And classes is not name calling. It's you know it's a political term with a very uh, with a very explicit meaning, and the meaning is that you're discriminating against working class people. Um, so, sorry, it's hard to keep track of the stack while I'm speaking. So, um, so after me, it looks like is Barb, and then we have Bill, Mike, Tom, Carrie, Patty. Go ahead, Barb. Uh, so we have two issues going on. One issue is the voting and the other issue is the discussion. We plan this time to have a discussion and then the voting doesn't happen immediately. Uh, it's happening um, off the time that we have here. And we've been doing votes this way for over a year now. And even before that, when we had in-person meetings, and we didn't have very many people in certain districts. Um, we have had district um, elections off of our official meeting time too, because there wasn't an actual quorum at the meeting or people were really worried that there weren't enough people participating. So um, we may not have a bylaw written saying that we can vote off of these meetings and Right now, I'm in Milwaukee and Dave's in Madison. So technically, we're both not in the same place, but yet we have decided that we can meet this way and that's that we are both present here because we can see each other's faces, we have names on our screens, we have information online that attaches our our personality, well, our person to our online persona. We do our voting through an email that we know is attached to a specific person, um, that we know all of these people have paid us money. So we have some of their financial information attached to a person. So it's, it's not just like these random personalities online can be voting. We have used this method and decided to use it for some time now. So I'm not sure that it's in order to say that not only can we not have a discussion about an issue, but we can't have a vote because we're all online. This is not really a new thing for us. Um, and I know that our bylaws were written before Zoom became, um, was even in existence really. So perhaps in the future, we might want to write that into the bylaws, but we've been doing this for a couple of years. So I, I really think that it's out of order to say that we can't have this vote, especially if we have 20 or more people voting, which would make it quorum. Um, and at this point, uh, you know, we should cut off the stack pretty soon so that we can have the discussion because that's what we are, we've planned this time to do. And it's very important to have these discussions. Not only are we here in person having them, so the seven, 18 people who are here now can participate and listen, but also they're recorded online. So people in the future who didn't get to attend, they can still have participated in the discussion by listening to what we all have had to say. So this stuff is really important to continue on the discussion. And, and I don't think that it's a, a good idea to hamper that discussion by saying we should just cut it off and, and leave it till the fall because we are all here today. And, um, and there, there are enough of us at least to discuss, if not to vote tonight. Um, I'll pass, thanks. Thanks, Barb. And just as a point of information, we do have 20 uh, folks now in the meeting. So um, the, you know, just to let people know. So, um, and welcome to the people who just joined us. Uh, thanks for being here. So um, let's see. So after Barb, we have Bill, 
Mike, Tom, Carrie, Patty, Andrea. Mike hasn't spoken yet. He should go first. Okay, Mike. Yeah, I, I mainly wanted to note that we are now 33 minutes into our allocated time uh, for discussion and we haven't started discussing yet. Uh, clearly, uh, I, I believe that uh, the, this, the, this, uh, this discussion about discussing uh, reflects the uh, rough, uh, reflects the different positions on the substance. So I hope we can get to the substance very soon. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. That's a great point. And so uh, Joe Nathan agrees with Barb to call off the stack and have the plan discussion. Yeah. And now that we have 21 participants in the meeting, the, um, you know, objections regarding quorum are moot. So let's get to the plan discussion on the agenda. And um, yeah, so if, uh, you know, folks can, if folks still want to stay on the stack who are on uh, that is fine, um, but at this point we will be uh, talking about the uh, actual proposed issue. Um, yeah, so sorry, just to make it clear, please, if you want to get on stack, please put it back into the chat so we, we can be clear. Um, all right, so welcome again to the folks who just joined us. And, um, you know, I'll uh, refer you again. So if you go to the uh, WIGP 2021 Spring Gathering page, um, so the proposed bylaws amendments are on this page. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, they were discussed at the, um, Excuse me, I think I was on stack. Yeah, yeah, I'm just introing the item here. Okay. And then, then we'll go to the stack. Um, yeah, so, so these were uh, discussed at the, at the 2020 fall gathering. Um, people uh, gave feedback, uh, you know, on the wording and, you know, other issues. Uh, so the proposal one is to add article two, section eight removal, um, which folks can see here. Uh, I won't read it out unless people are unable to, you know, access that link. And then proposal two to amend article 10 discrimination section one conduct. Um, so Uh, all right, so let's go to the stack. Uh, so I see Bill, Sam, Bruce. Uh, go ahead, Bill. As to the substance of the two proposed bylaws changes, for me, both of them fit into the category of what you might call no-brainers. We had a standard that candidates and elected officials will, were held to in the past. They could be removed for gross misconduct or for departing from our platform or values. The proposal is simply to hold membership to the same standard. I've never heard of anybody kicked out of the Wisconsin Greens I hope we never have a day when somebody might be kicked out. But there are people out there who could join our organization with a bad intent. And as far as the first proposal, I think we need some elementary standard by which we hold our members accountable. Very elementary gross misconduct, that sort of thing. On the second proposal, 
we took a look at the language on discrimination in our old bylaws and decided that it was time to do a little updating. So we expanded and elaborated the standard and explanation of what constitutes discrimination. So that is in the second proposal. I think both of these are supportable and um, I think we should submit it to the members to see what they think. Pass. All right, uh, next up is Sam. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I agree with what um, Bill expressed. Um, you know, I mean, as far as the uh, first uh, proposal, um, you know, my, my thought on it is, I think that we can all imagine um, some type of behavior that we would find unacceptable and we would not want to be occurring in, um, in the party. Um, and that might be, people might have different conceptions of what that is, you know, but if somebody were coming in and spouting, you know, like Holocaust denial, then, you know, I don't think that we should have to just tolerate that. Um, or, or what have you. Um, so, I mean, I think that it's, that, that there needs to be some sort of, um, mechanism that a, that a party has to, to deal with that. Um, as far as the second proposal, I mean, I think, I think the onus is sort of on anybody that is going to say, well, these groups should not be added or these um criteria shouldn't be added as to why that <laughs> why those uh, shouldn't be protected um so yeah i mean i think that these are both pretty uh common sense and and obvious um pass okay uh next is bruce Okay, I don't believe I had a chance to discuss this in the fall because my wife had scheduled a contractor to come over and talk to us about getting some new windows. So I would have uh, probably said the same things I'm about to say now. Uh, one major ob objection is uh, it says right there in the background, this has never been an issue. So why is it an issue now? Another problem I have with the proposal, it says that people can be basically kicked out of the party for disagreeing with the platform. Well, then how does the platform change if people don't see, uh, have problems with some of the policies or uh, better policies? I mean, you know, it's just, that's pretty broad. That's a pretty broad category for kicking people out of the party. They don't agree with the platform. There's a lot of things the GPUS platform, I don't agree with, but it's 80 pages long, so there's bound to be a few things. Fortunately, our state platform isn't that long, but uh, who knows, it could be someday. We actually uh, got into policies. <sighs> but probably my biggest concern is historical. How do parties like ours fall apart? Look at the socialists. How many socialist parties are in this country now? Half dozen, dozen, 40, 50. What usually happens is a, a small group of highly ideological people worm their way into positions of leadership and then start enforcing their particular ideology. And after that, you get the purges and the schisms, schisms and stuff like that. And so the one party end up with uh, a half a dozen. That's history, you know. When I was a teenager, I saw it happen with the uh, Students for Democratic Society, where the Weather Underground split off because they thought we needed to be more violent. You know? The Green Party has always been based on values, which are a lot broader an ideology. 
Originally in Europe, uh, their basic values was opposition to war, peace, opposition to nuclear power, nuclear weapons, concerns for the environment, social justice. But, uh, you know, it was a party, I was very happy to see that because I understood this history of how third parties splinter and fall apart. And I saw in the Green Movement slash party at the time, something that would draw, draw a broader uh, coalition of people together through values instead of strict adherence to ideologies. But unfortunately, we are moving away from that. We're getting caught up in identity politics, which as far as I'm concerned, is just a way to divide and conquer people. Look at how well the Democrats have used it. And the Republicans have their own form of, of, of divide and conquer as well. So we're gonna do that too. Is that a strategy that's gonna work for us? It's gonna build this party? Or a lot of more, a lot of rules and the ability to kick people out. Is that just gonna keep us a, a boutique party? Which is what we are right now. We're a boutique party, you know. And we certainly have no strength. We have almost nobody that's ever been elected to partisan office, maybe a handful, five, I think. And two or three of those were actually Democrats that became Greens and then uh, basically were uh, unelected by a Democratic Party in the next election. So we're not doing all that great. So why do we want to set up rules to keep people out or to kick people out? The only time I can remember, I mean, usually what happens is if people don't like what they're doing, they just, we're doing, they just leave. About 10 years ago, there was a proposal that was made to serve nothing but vegan food at our gatherings. And there were two people from Madison, so a couple of union organizers actually, who were quite offended by that and they quit, you know. It was unfortunate because they were people with experience and, and you know, Bruce, I, I want you to be able to speak, but can you please stay on topic? Um, there well, are there are a number of that is a topic. That is the to topic. I didn't get a chance to speak last fall, okay? And you, you can talk as much as you want. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize that I was going to miss that. So well, the agenda was published ahead of time, but anyway, please stay on topic so that other people. It is a topic. I'm concerned about the future of the Green Party. And the stuff that's going on in the state party, the stuff that's going on on national level, where people are trying to kick out the Green Party of Georgia. Green Party of Rhode Island has already left. They kicked out the, what few people there were in Alaska. I mean, what's going on here? I don't approve. And I don't think this proposal is going to help any. And I think it should be tabled until the fall until we can get a broader discussion of this amongst the entire membership, which could happen if we put in a, well, a listserv, which we've been talking about. I mean, that happens at the national level when they do proposals. Delegates, all 150 delegates, whatever, get to talk, get to, to express their, their issues, you know, their concerns over a particular proposal. So, that's all I have to say, and I will be leaving the meeting. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. So next is Carrie. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a couple of things I wanted to say. First of all, I, this is going back to um, something that um, was mentioned earlier. I, I'm really troubled by the characterization um, that insistence that we follow written bylaws are anti-democratic, obstructionist, classist, et cetera. I have never attended a political party convention where people not in attendance could vote on issues. I understand we're in a pandemic, but these things should have been clarified well ahead of time. It shouldn't be up for discussion now. It should have been clarified in, in, in process during this whole, whole, whole thing. Um, also in response to what uh, Jonathan had said earlier, that um, with his characterizations of Bruce being forceful, 
it seems to me that um, there should, that it's more than appropriate uh, for an insistence that bylaws are followed. Um, also, he indicated that um, the discussion that occurred at the fall gathering was without issue and, and it wasn't. There were valid concerns raised about both of these proposals. And it's obvious to me that they both demand additional discussion. Um, now, moving on to the, the actual proposal, I, I have concerns about them as well. Um, by existing Wisconsin GP bylaws that use this language, um, neither Howie or Angela could have been our candidates for president and vice president respectively. They both had violation of platform with their advocacy for sex work is work. And um, I mean, I can read that for you or I can put a link in the chat about what the language is in our platform about um, the Nordic model and how that terminology sex work is not to be used in reference to prostitution. So it seems to me that right there, if the party is not holding our candidates accountable to platform, why should we be holding membership to violations of platform? It, it seems um, counterproductive to me. Pass. Okay, uh, Joe Nathan is up next, then Barb. All right, well, it's a good thing that it's all on recording and reviewable. So whatever your interpretation, it's there in reality. So I just wanted to say that the Democrats and the Republicans uh, don't have a real moral background. They don't have a real uh, set of uh, ethics. It's money for them. And um, we do. We have ethics and we have a policy and platform and it's good we got 20 pages of rules for us at the state level and 80 pages of rules for us at the national level and if you violate those well then you're not worthy of the green party and this is what that amendment's about and i appreciate it and i i i guess i'll just say on record i do take exception of bruce's characterization of identity movement as simply divide and conquer. I think it's very important for a lot of people, especially in the context that uh, monotheistic theology is running the country. And um, monotheistic theology has this sort of like identity, singularity uh, focus. And a lot of people don't, or they don't identify with that. And it's important to a lot of diverse people. And that's what we're trying to diversely include people. So I think these two amendments are perfectly in line with maintaining a functional, uh, growing, vital party. And I think that's what we got. And I fully support moving the discussion democratically towards the internet. Thanks, pass. All right, uh, Barbara? Thanks. Uh, I'll try and keep it short. I think that these two proposals are very good as written. Um, the first one, um, I think I, I do share a little bit of Bruce's concern about the word platform in there. I think that he made a good point that um, if we think about our national platform, it is very lengthy. Um, our state one is five pages long at this point. And sometimes people take exception to one um, one piece or another, and they don't agree with us on every small point, but they agree with our four values. And um, if they're following our code of conduct, then that, um, that would be fine with me to keep people like that in the party. Um, it's really important, though, to be able to kick people out who are being abusive and cannot follow that code of conduct and don't even believe in our four values. That's very important. And I, and I think that's really the crux of what that first one is getting to. The second one, um, and, and we had a long discussion about this, so I don't wanna rehash everything. I think that it's really important that we um, update that based on the language that is current to our society. 
And I think that everything that was updated in there is appropriate. Yeah. Um, although uh, either way that it was written, it could be taken out of context. People could say, for example, that um, you know, if the Green Party had a nature walk or something, um, then that that might be uh, you know not okay. It, it would be discriminatory towards people with a disability, maybe. Um, some of this stuff will will be vague and have to be taken on a case by case basis. But the way that it is written and the way that we have it um, updated, that wouldn't change it either way. So I think that both of them are are really good and important. Um, I would advise that maybe we think about taking out the platform element um, as a as an amendment to that um, after voting this one in. But I think they're both good as is. Pass. All right, thanks, Barb. So I'm next on the stack. And um, yeah, I, you know, agree with many of the points that have been made. Um, and I also agree that, you know, with Bill, the question before us is whether or not to submit this proposal to the entire membership for their consideration. Um, so, you know, I, I do want us to be able to get through the stack you know, it is getting close to noon. Uh, after me, I only I see Mike and uh, Andrea. Um, then I do want to move that we, uh, you know, vote on whether to submit this proposal to the entire membership for their consideration. Um, and yeah, uh, try not to. I, I do just want to speak to the the platform issue that's being brought up. Um, sorry, Tom, I must have missed you somehow. Uh, I, I will add you to sec. I wanted to, um, yeah, speak to the platform issue that's been brought up several times. So the, um, so this is talking about, again, it's identical to language for removal of officers, candidates, elected officials. And it says gross misconduct or violation of the adopted key values platform or code of conduct. Um, so the, the code of conduct basically is, you know, rules of behavior uh, is not to be hostile or, you know, attack other members um, and other things, uh, you know, of that nature. Uh, the values we all know and understand, uh, you know, although they are sort of vague in some ways, if someone came in saying, you know, the Green Party needs to be violent, that would be a clear violation of our value of nonviolence. Um, so as for the platform, here's why it's important, first of all, and why it's not as big of an issue as, uh, yeah, as some people may think. Um, you know, if there have been actual cases where uh, Holocaust deniers and Nazis have joined the Green Party and, you know, it, what Sam said before might have sounded hyperbolic, but unfortunately it's not. We've had that or, you know, just other garden variety white supremacists because they see a party, they see a platform, they see a way to try to gain legitimacy for their ideas. Um, sometimes they even try to run for office then. Um, and what, what would we do if, you know, say a Holocaust denying Nazi were to join the Wisconsin Green Party and be very civil and respectful and um, follow our code of conduct and say, oh, no, I'm not one of the violent ones. I believe in nonviolence. I just want to preach this message. Um, you know, then what recourse do we have? Well, they're not violating our values or our, our code of conduct. So, um, you know, it, they're violating our platform. And there still is plenty of room for disagreement within the party and debate about issues that, um, you know, 
we can have some reasonable amount of debate on. Um, you know, that that's important and that's how the party will change. And, you know, there are a few people who agree with 100% of the National Green Party platform to the letter or anything like that. And it's not like people will be automatically removed from the party uh, if they don't. Uh, in fact, it's a very um, cumbersome process where you would have to get a large number of people to vote to remove somebody. So that's not going to happen for, um, you know, uh, for small things. And if we have candidates who are not following our platform, then we should be able to remove them and say, actually, we disavow this candidate. Um, you know, and it's, it's one thing if it's something like saying, okay, sex work is work that, you know, actually many greens agree with that. And, you know, there's a reasonable amount of debate within the party, um, and advocacy for the New Zealand model. Um, if someone were to get the green party nomination, and start saying, uh, you know, genocide denial and stuff like that, then we need to be able to remove them. And it's, uh, you know, the, the same goes for members because one of the ways that a, a party can be destroyed, especially one that is growing and that is seen as a threat is, uh, you know, for it to be infiltrated and then um, associated with, uh, you know, these, uh, toxic ideas. So, um, anyway, that, that's what I want to say about that. And I will pass. Um, so I think we have Mike, Andrea and Tom, and then, uh, why don't we move after that to, uh, to vote on, uh, sending these proposals to the membership for a vote. Uh, so next is Mike. Uh, I'll be brief and to, and to the point. Uh, we are a party of values. Uh, this, these amend, I see these amendments uh, simply as ways to protect and enforce our values. Uh, they need to be passed. Okay. Uh, next up is um, Andrea. There we go. Um, yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, I mean, I, I agree people need to be removed. I think what you said that it's not an automatic removal. It's really um, something that has to be egregious enough for a lot of people to agree that the person needs to be removed and, and uh, yeah, I think that's a that's a pretty high bar. So I'm yeah, in favor of the bylaws changes. Okay. And then Tom is the last person on stack. Um, and you know, after that we'll move to vote. Uh, go ahead, Tom. Okay. So I was trying to capture this this issue about the quorum. I think one way to look at this is there's we have this idea that there might be a quorum to trigger the election. In other words, the election could not even be initiated unless we had a quorum. And then the other, the other way to look at it is that we initiate the election regardless of the, <coughs> any kind of a quorum requirement. And then we simply look at the number of people that voted and is the numerator and then the denominator being the uh, total number of number of eligible vo voters. So I, I don't, I want to keep an open mind on uh, what ultimately is the right solution. I, I can't comment on what is in the bylaws. Um, but just going on here, uh, most of my comments ha are not addressing the specific issue that's from the prior stack. So in general, I, I think we should look at designing a mechanism to accelerate the decision making, and this big gap in between <clears throat> meetings if, could be dealt with by that general discussion group, and conceivably we could have uh, we could have elections, or you know we could have votes in between the gatherings. 
um, so that's this wouldn't seem like such a rush. There's this sense of urgency that I think seems false to this. Just um, so there's that, and then um, yeah, I guess I'm just emphasizing the discussion list, having that mailing list. Now there had it contrary to this idea that there's been this vigorous discussion and so forth. There's actually been some counter efforts to stifle discussion or maybe they weren't intended to stifle discussion but they had that effect uh and uh, you know i'm specific there there's a, you know um, there's a couple of people that are uh in the gender critical movement that have been um basically shunned and um uh, prevented to some degree from uh, and discouraged from uh, expressing themselves, at least in my opinion. I know it's not simple, but um, so that's that. I would just, I think I'm done. Pass. Okay. Thanks, everybody. All right. So now uh, at this point, um, sorry that we've gone a few minutes over, but we're going to call a vote. Um, so if people are in favor of uh, sending these bylaws proposals to uh, our members for a vote. Um, please vote yes or aye. Um, if you are opposed, please vote no or nay. Uh, and put this in the chat, by the way, that, that will make it easy to count. Um, and if you would like to abstain, then please just write abstain. All right, so, so please put your vote into the chat now. All right, so if you haven't voted yet, then please put your vote in the chat. We'll give people one more minute. Okay. And just one more reminder, please put your vote into the chat. If you don't, then that is effectively an abstain. All right. So the count is 14 yes, four no, and two abstain. Um, does that seem accurate? Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. So 
Um, we're a few minutes over. Um, so let us try to come back. Um, let's see. I think our first panel discussion starts at 12.45. Um, so please go ahead and get some lunch. And uh, if folks are still eating at 12.45, no problem. Just come back and, uh, and join us. And our panel discussions will start. So uh, don't worry if you're not finished with your lunch. Um, all right, thanks everybody. And we will now break until 12.45. Dave, maybe you could come up with, uh, or we could put a, um, share a document that says uh, out to lunch or something. Oh, yeah, sure. Would you be willing to do that? Well, I was going to go to lunch. <laughs> we have any uh -huh. volunteer. <laughs> no, I, I need a break. <laughs> Somebody who's more rested than I am. All right. I Let can me see put that up. Let me see if cool. I can do that. Okay, so Dave, you're going to do it. If you are, I'm going to go to lunch. Otherwise, I can do it. I mean, you might put you might put most like show the agenda, and then at the top in a big font, hey, you know, we'll resume it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. I'm working on it now. So, are we going off recording soon? That would be a question for Tom. I I think it's still recording and live streaming unless Tom has paused that. Are you there, Tom? I can pause recording if you want, um, Patty here. Oh, um, this is Joe Nathan. Um, I I had a um, 10 minute delivery and I, uh, just for posterity and I'd like it to be recorded and uh, not have anybody be captive audience in official capacity. Could I just spiel on for a while and have it there? I don't see why um, not. That's, yeah, you know, and also you can, um, we can try to find some space on the agenda for that, you know, maybe like at the end uh, after Howie or right before Howie, something like that. I mean, you don't have to, uh, uh, during the break, I, don't, I guess I wouldn't mind going after Howie. And if people want to cut out, they can. All right, sounds good. Um, well, then, if Patty wouldn't mind pausing the recording, that would be great or the live streaming or both? Um, I can pause the recording. I'm not sure about the live streaming. OK. You can keep the live streaming going, and I'll just put up this message. So you do want the recording paused? I think that would be good. OK, and then I'll pause it, and then I'm going to go to lunch. So remember when, when it's time to start up again, if I'm not back. Um, Make sure somebody remembers to remind Tom to start it again. Cool. Okay, it's now. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right, can you see this, uh, my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. All right, enjoy your lunch. See you at 12.45.
All right, we're just about ready to start rolling again. Um, it is 12.44 right now. We said we get started at 12.45. Um, our panel guests are here and we want to you know, give people a chance to get back from lunch, but we also want to make sure we get right to our panel discussions and uh, make sure we have time to hear from all of our guest speakers. Um, all right, so yeah, why don't we um, get rolling and, oh yeah, so for, for people who've just joined us, if you can rename yourself in Zoom, uh, just so we can see who's here and participating with us. Um, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, then uh, please go ahead and do that. Um, and yeah, so why don't we um, get going with our uh, with our panel discussion? Uh, we have Brian Benford, Alex Brower, and Tessa Echeverria. Uh, they've all joined us today um, as Green endorsed local candidates to um, talk about their experience uh, running for office, um, sort of what you know they've learned and uh, things to pass on to Wisconsin Greens and potential future candidates, and you know how we can stay involved in local politics and local government and really make a difference because that's you know where. Um, over the years, we've had lots of people um, elected, lots of Greens elected to local office, to city council, county board, school board. And, um, you know, even um, without being elected necessarily, just making a difference at the local level in local government. Um, so I will um, pass it. I'll pass it over. Um, I guess we'll just go in alphabetical order to start with, and you know, then just um, you know, give each of our guests, uh, let's say, uh, five minutes to to speak at the start, if you like, and um, then we can open it up for discussion and questions. Um, so, for, first up, uh, let's welcome Brian Benford. Thanks for being here, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm sitting outside. So uh, it's really great to be with you all. And I'm sorry that I couldn't join earlier. I was running uh, errands with my youngest son, but I'm really happy to be here now. So uh, once again, thanks for inviting me, Dave. And uh, let me just start off by saying that uh, my name is Brian Benford. I'm the alder elect for District 6 for the city of Madison, so I'll be sworn in this next Tuesday the 20th. I'm also a former alder person for the city of Madison. So as I look at all the postage stamp screens here, I'm really honored to be here with Tessa and Benji and, and I see Rebecca here, who's just been uh, one of my idols that fought so hard for so many issues. So uh, my perspectives on running for office as a green. Um, so there's a couple of things. I, I don't want to uh, project that every community is the same, but here in Madison, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about this uh, because uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is put together what's called a leadership lab. So I've been working with East High School kids. That's a, a local high school here in Madison. Uh, to bring in emerging leaders and to team them with season leaders. So we've been having these conversations quite a bit, what it's like to run for a political office. So there's all the mechanics of running for office. There's the campaigning, there's the seeking endorsements, there's building those interpersonal connections with your future constituents. Now during COVID campaigning is really difficult for grassroots campaigns. Uh, in the old days, you would knock on thousands of doors and once again, try to build rapport and those really intentional interpersonal relationships with people. But uh, 
so so there's all of that that's really important there's the literature there's all the nuts and bolts of campaigning but there's something that uh what i explained to the the young leaders that i'm working with i call it the gobbledygook <laughs> the gobbledygook the so what that means is that within, I, and I'm making the assumption that's at all levels of politics, I'm making the assumption that uh, it could be in all municipalities, but here in Madison, oftentimes you run into what I call interpersonal institutional uh, conflicts. So uh, individuals that maybe had a conflict with each other 10 years ago or so, uh, it's easy to get sucked into that by affiliation. So in, in Madison, uh, what I always tell people is that as an older person, uh, before I even started this journey and even in the past, I would do this really simple exercise. I would go out on the street and of course imagine before the pandemic, uh, but even now I would go out on the street and I would stop 10 random people within the district. And I would ask them the question, I would, I, I would uh, say, hey, I'm kind of new to the area. I would say I'm new to the area. Can you tell me who the older person was? So out of those 10 people, I would be surprised if one or two people could tell me who their older person was. In my district, District 6, people are pretty engaged. So maybe three people would know who their older person is. And out of those three people, maybe one might know what an alder does, an alder person does for the city. So please keep that in mind. That's the whole context of this. And the voting totals will really uh, uh, reinforce that, that uh, in local elections, uh, not that many people vote. So, so once again, out of 10 people, if, if three people even know who their alder person is. So, so we're dealing with that context, but there's many people here locally that are really plugged in behind the scenes. So that group of people, and we, we jokingly call them the usual suspects, are people that weld a great deal of power because they're tuned in. So, you know, as an older person, you're sitting at the table, you have a vote, you have the opportunity to uh, project underrepresented voices. You have an opportunity to fight for marginalized and vulnerable people. And all of that is really, really important. And there's a great deal of responsibility and a great deal of power with that. But until we become relevant as a body, uh, and when I go out and ask 10 people all there is, if I could get half of those people to say uh, who the alder is, then I think I'm doing a good job. So when you're campaigning and running for local office, you're running up against that reality that folks just aren't plugged in. And those that are plugged in, once again, I had mentioned the institutional conflict. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of that going on. And uh, we joke uh, here, uh, the folks in my orbit, that it's a lot like high school cliques here locally. There's these cliques that come together. So what I'm trying to do as a, a newly elected alder and as I bring in new people into public policy, we wanna keep our heads down and just avoid all of that and stay focused on the, on the platforms and on the issues that are relevant to all of us joining this call today. So that's one of the biggest challenges that I found uh, running. So that, once again, that's one of the biggest challenges that I found here locally, that uh, you want to do your due diligence. Uh, I believe that my, my heart is true and I ran for all the right reasons and my service will be focused on, uh, once again, those that don't have a voice at the table. But to try to avoid all of the other conflicts is just very frustrating. So I, I would tell people running for office that stay true to your heart, know why you're running. Uh, I often say that our platforms as Greens are, are key principles of really set the roadmap to a uh, fantastic service. So uh, you gotta stay true to yourself. You have to know why you're running. And uh, as far as like suggestions and new candidates, the biggest thing I would say is don't get caught up in triangulation of other 
of other issues and other people's institutional conflicts. Stay true to why you're running. And I believe that your service will be commendable. So I don't know if that's five minutes, but I, I'm happy to pass and hear what other people say. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, yeah, we can pass it around. And like I said, there will be a, some chance for questions and discussion. Um, so uh, next up, just in alphabetical order, let's, let's go over to Alex Brower. Thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for having me here today. I'm, I'm honestly honored to be joined on this panel with uh, Tessa and Brian, uh, Tessa, excuse me, Tessa and Brian, you know, congratulations to both of you for winning election. Um, I actually didn't know that I've been here in the Milwaukee bubble and, <laughs> and didn't even, you know, and then I was kind of out of connection for a while after my election, but it, honestly, congratulations to both of you. And I know um, that you guys are going to fight for, um, oh, I'm sorry, Tessa. I thought David said he had won. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Congratulations to Brian and but Tessa, congratulations for running as well, you know, and, and, and standing up for for what's right and the values that we all share um, here in the Green Party and beyond. You know, I ran for school board. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Alex Brower. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I ran for school board in this last municipal election here in Milwaukee uh, for school board district five. Um, as an open socialist, as a DSA-backed endorsed socialist, along with my endorsement here, the, uh, the Milwaukee County Green Party and my membership. Um, but I uh, also ran last year in 2020 for city comptroller for the city of Milwaukee as well on an environmental uh, and social justice platform, which I did as well for the school board here. But um, yeah, you know, my experience running um, was one of standing up to the establishment. I really appreciated what Brian said um, about the, the high school cliques operating in, in power. You know, we have to do everything we can to fight those. And I think that everybody here in this room, um, you know, all the people I see and know here, you know, do that on a daily basis. And we have to keep doing that work in order to achieve the change that we want to see in society. Um, so when I, you know, when I ran, I encountered some of the same stuff that what Brian was talking about with the establishment. Um, you know, they will throw everything they can at candidates like us who stand up for transformative change. And unfortunately, you know, I was hit with some pretty negative pieces. They wrote a, my opposition was able to get a hit piece in the journal Sentinel um, on me, uh, accusing me of mismanaging funds for a, a uh, project I was involved with, which couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and we had so much outpouring of support for that. But, um, but I think that just shows how afraid and scared they were based on what we were talking about. Um, so I ended up uh, losing I, uh, the election on April 6th. I got 45%. My opponent got 55% um, of the vote. But um, overall, you know, my messages to folks who are running or consider running or even who want to be involved in campaigns or making transformative change, you know, my message is to expect opposition from the establishment, to expect to be a joke in establishment circles, but you should welcome that. Uh, is my is my message because the establishment, you know, the world is the way that it is. Um, not because of destiny or because of anything like that, or because of any sort of divine intervention, the world is the way it is because specific individuals made specific decisions throughout the courses of history to arrive at where we are right now in humanity. And so I think that um, the fact that we're here in a, in a situation where, you know, the, the environment is on the brink of collapse, where um, black and brown folks are being murdered in the streets and we should acknowledge that that's you know still ongoing and not not solved just because Joe Biden is in the Oval Office, right? Um, that all the all these issues that we're facing this this the, the sustainability issue, the the issue of of black and brown lives not being honored, the issue of education funding not be where, being where it is, um, the issue of our democracy being on the brink of being lost to a corporate oligarchy if it hasn't already been lost to that corporate oligarchy. Um, all of those issues and a, and a whole bunch more are, are all the reasons that we need to keep fighting. Um, and so when we face um, opposition from the establishment, we should be welcoming it because they 
when they when they start to oppose us, they know that they're af- we know that they're afraid of us, and it's another reason just to keep uh, just to keep on fighting. Um, so in our campaign, we ran a really vigorous on the ground campaign. We knocked on approximately twenty eight thousand doors in the election uh, for school board. Um, we made tens of thousands of phone calls. Actually, I was really honored um, that uh, one of the one of the leaders of the Wisconsin Green Party, uh, Barbara Dahlgren, was able to join our team right at the end as a as an organizer and join our staff and. And I really want to give a shout out to Barbara and everybody, you know, with the Milwaukee, with the Milwaukee Greens who helped me get signatures and helped me knock on doors. I'm seeing Tom here. I'm seeing Bill here who helped organize some stuff digitally. Uh, You know, I just really appreciated all the work. And that's how we can, you know, win these things is just by coming together and building alternative outside structures outside of the corporate power structure that exists where corporations in our Alex, are you there? Okay. Um, it yeah. So it, it looks like Alex froze. Um, so, um, Alex, are you there? I'm seeing you on the list. Um, it's, Zoom tends to be pretty tenacious about let, not letting go of a bad kind of, he may recover or he may get kicked out, but. Okay. Um, well, let, um, so let's move to uh, Tessa for right now and hopefully Alex will rejoin us in a minute. And um, all right, so uh, Tessa, take it away. Cool, yes, yeah, the joy of uh, unstable internet connections. Um, <laughs> So yeah, thanks Thanks for inviting me to come. Thanks for the, the Greens for the endorsement. I think um, I don't want to repeat the things that, that Brian and Alex say. I was, so I would say one of the main things I, there are two main things I took away from the campaign. One um, was that as, as movement candidates, right? As, as socialists or as, as Green Party members, um, what are the other goals besides winning the election that make it worthwhile to run, right? I think we need to understand there are some circumstances where it will be a more competitive race and there's a chance to win. And there are some circumstances where the, the chance to win is fairly low. What are the other things we're doing? How are we building people um, into movements, uh, either you know to join the DSA or to join the Green Party or to be active in their neighborhood? So what are other benchmarks along your campaign that you can strive for? Um, what issues do you want to get out on the city level? Uh, for my campaign, it was a lot about uh, public internet and public utilities, right? Using that fight to say we should not have private companies in control of our energy grid, which is something that is attached to movements already in town and can continue to grow, even though you know we lost the election. Um, so I think you should think about those if you're running, right, as a movement candidate. How do we build the power of the Green Party? How do we make it an alternative that is more uh, accepted by a larger group of people? Um, And how does that incorporate into how you're running? The other thing that I kept running against was people's imagination, right? Like we would say, we want to end homelessness. And people would go, well, you can't do that. It's too hard. Like this person who's a progressive built, you know, 10 tiny homes for 10 homeless people to live in. And that's like as good as we can imagine, like ending homelessness. So being able to tackle these large systemic root issues um, and get people to understand that like, we can actually transform our society. Like if we do take money from the police, we can actually fund affordable housing. Uh, We can actually do that show. So I think that there's a gap between um, the the long-term vision of where we want to go and people's um, perception of what can actually be accomplished on a local level, right? There's, like Brian was saying, most people don't know who their alder is and most people don't know what the city actually does, but there is actually a lot of power and control there to reshape how our cities work and affect people's lives. So there's a lot of education that has to go into what these decisions actually mean and what is actually possible. Uh, it may seem 
crazy to people to think that we can actually implement a Green New Deal locally, but we can't, right? Like we can work towards sustainable energy on a local level. Obviously, that's not enough. We need a, a national and a global response to climate change. But that doesn't mean that we can't be uh, taking control of the means of energy and the means of production at a local level and actually improving people's lives. And people will have that buy-in once they see their lives actually improve from these policies. Um, so those were the two big things I think that we combated during the campaign um, and had to constantly be thinking through having a brain trust of people to talk to, right? Organizations you're connected to, you don't have an expert on every issue that's gonna come at you in a pin or at city council, you just need to be connected to the people who are, right? You need to be connected to the environmental groups that can tell you the newest thing for solar energy and you need to be connected to the unions to learn about what labor laws need to change on a local level. Uh, you need to have that network. You don't need to be personally uh, the expert on everything and you probably shouldn't try to be. <laughs> Um, I also, is Alex back? No, I don't see him. Um, I know that also, I, I don't want to take up extra time, but Benji and Rebecca are both, you know, green endorsed candidates are running and I would, I would see the rest of my time if either of them wanted to, to pipe up for a second. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, Benji, Rebecca and, uh, Grant are. Oh yeah, Grant, I didn't even see you, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and hopefully Alex will rejoin in a minute. But um, yeah, uh, you know, if, if any of our endorsed candidates would like to, to join in, um, I think, you know, we could all agree that would be great. Just let us know. Um, I love what Tessa was saying. I don't know what the question was. Tessa was saying. Oh, sorry, I'm getting a little feedback there. Um, yeah, I don't, sorry, this is Grant. I was just saying, I, I loved hearing what Tessa was saying. It sounded right on. I joined late though. I don't know what the question was, it's like a little bit like Jeopardy. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, we just asked folks about their experiences running for office and sort of, you know, any lessons that they have uh, for, people who want to get involved in local government, people who might be interested in running for office and, you know, just about how we can make a difference, you know, at the local level. Oh, wow. <laughs> I just watched, Rebecca sent me um, a, a video, I worked Snow and Video, I just got done watching, um, kind of talking about this, I guess, in a different way and about, um, the conspiracies that are that are in the works right now in the systems of power and um yeah everybody has to get involved or we're doomed i'll say that for sure um and yeah i mean and and this stuff is just rolling along honestly it's so hard to even explain um you know on tuesday the common council like they're going to ask us to approve like nine million dollars for a new parking ramp on south park street and like you know tessa's talking about like sustainability right i mean we know that like <laughs> doubling down on cars to move a, to move human beings around is um, like not gonna work. Um, but here we are, right? And like what, how many homes can we build for $9 million? Cause we can use TIF funds for affordable housing. Um, but like, that's a, that's a question that's gonna be on the common council on Tuesday. Like nobody even knows about it, <laughs> right? So um, yeah, there's so much going on. Um, I mean, I'm gonna try and, and, and share information, you know, kind of suffering on the inside. Um, but if, if people on the outside aren't stepping up and joining hands, there's no way. I mean, you can't elect enough people to stop this thing. Uh, it has it has to be it has to be everybody participating in solidarity because none of us have as much power as the few people that are in control do. So um, yeah, I mean, if, if you're game, if you're in for it, if you got some time and energy, please do pay attention and, and speak up. Yeah, thanks, Grant. And yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly speaking for myself, you know, I feel like many, you know, we can always uh, do more in terms of following what's going on in local government and, you know, making our voices heard and, and trying to 
lean on whatever uh, levers we have to, you know, make our voices heard. And, um, you know, we should also talk more uh, going forward about, you know, ways that folks who are on the inside can, um, you know, call us in to, to help out. Um, just as one idea, you know, we, we do have our local party email lists and, you know, that would be just a, you know, I, I think we'd really appreciate hearing um, about any issues that come up that, you know, Greens might be able to help with. Yeah, I mean, one one quick idea, I mean, we, one of the environmental groups um, kind of touches base with me like every week, sends me an email on Sunday, is like, hey, any transportation related stuff coming up this week, which is honestly, I mean, maybe it'd be great if I could do that without a reminder, but um, I mean, maybe there's a way for somebody on the green side to do something like that. Because, um, you know, the few of us that are, are there doing this work on the inside, I mean, I, I, I'll i dig through all the agendas. I know what's out there, but, you know, it's really hard to like then take that next level of energy to like spread it all the way around. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be really helpful. And honestly, it'd be great to, I love to see the collaboration between Greens, DSA, Progressive Dane. Like we could probably do that one time for a bunch of groups that have really aligned, you know, values uh, and then spread it out to everybody's network. So I think that would be really, really valuable because we, we got to start connecting people so that folks know what's going on. Yeah, right on. Um, so yeah, uh, so it looks like we don't have Alex back yet. Um, so- hey, hey, Dave, I wanted to piggyback oh, on yes, please. something that Tessa and this, this really wise alder that wears a stormy Cromer hat uh, once told me that, uh, you know, the realtors are organized, the Madison Police Union is organized, all of these forces are organized and that it's really important that we that share uh, values of putting people before money or power first that we organize. And uh, so that's just germane to what we're talking about now. And in the help, uh, you know, there's, there's things that of course, policymakers were at the table. And once again, with that comes tremendous responsibility, but here in Madison, the way I look at it, if that if we can't all come together collectively, then how can we heal a divided community? So I think that the the uh, ownership is on everybody, not just the policymakers, but as the whole community. So please don't underestimate uh, what you can do to help and support us. Uh, I don't know the lay of the land in Milwaukee, and I'm just speaking for Madison, but I'm making the assumption it's the same everywhere that uh, I'm very proud to be a green endorsed candidate. And oftentimes in the past, I would say that, you know, there was all this work put into getting folks elected. And then it seems like everybody goes away <laughs> unless they're mad at you about something. So I would strongly encourage everybody to stay involved and please don't underestimate how much you can help. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, so I, I see that Alex has just been able to rejoin us. So um, Alex, since uh, you got cut off towards the end there, um, I wanted to toss it back over to you if, if you had anything that you wanted to add. Yeah, just real quick again, I'm so sorry. I, I left Milwaukee for a little bit just to get out and I'm in rural Oregon right now. Or the connection's a little spot. Um, but just to wrap up my thought here, I do apologize again. Um, you know, I just want to say, you know, we got to stay on and stay organized and stay mindful of everything that's going on and keep up the fight. That's how we're going to win. Um, I think we're so close in Milwaukee to winning Open Socialist and Greens, uh, two elections here in this city. Um, and I wanted to just throw something out. You know, one of the things that we're thinking about over here is just how we can change the dynamic and the and the situation going on. Um, I want to, uh, you know, let folks know that one of the things, you know, municipalities can do, and Brian, I'm really glad you got elected to the Madison Common Council. Um, you know, municipalities are able to use um, some different statutes and use power to make changes. One of the specific things that I would love to see us look at in Milwaukee, and, and if Madison wanted to join, it'd be great, is using Chapter 197 of the state statutes uh, to replace utilities with municipal ones. 
um, and really fight back against the power of utilities in that manner. Um, but those are all, those are all my thoughts. I, I appreciate the time. Uh, Tessa, I'm so sorry I didn't get a chance to hear what you had to say. Um, I do want to connect with you because I think we have a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on that we should be sharing between Madison and Milwaukee and our fights on the municipal level. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Um, so yeah, now we've, we've had a first go around and again, if any of our endorsed candidates, um, would like to join in, uh, you know, please feel free. And, um, so at this point, why don't we open it up to questions? Um, so I saw that, uh, Bill, I wanted to get on the stack. Yeah. I'm just gonna jump in for a second. Sorry. I had oh. my second COVID vaccine yesterday. I'm feeling like crap today. Um, but this is really uh, an important conversation that we're having at a really pivotal moment. Um, these elections in Madison were really a watershed in terms of um, you know, what, what Brian and Grant were talking about, the organized uh, money. Um, and the dark money. Um, there were, you know, two separate um, dark money billboard campaigns against against us, against us more radical folks, and you know, really on on a local scale, massive amounts of contributions from builders, national realtors association, etc. So that you know, my opponent had thirty to forty thousand dollars behind him in races, which usually cost about eight to ten thousand dollars to run. Um, and so when I ran for the first time in 2015, it was, it was uh, specifically to stop that, those forces from getting a foothold into, into local government, because in Madison, they hadn't had it yet um, to the level that it was there at the state and, and federal government. Um, and so, so in a way, I feel like I like that intention almost almost evoked this kind of response because I, you know, like Brian said, I governed that way for six years, um, just, um, you know, without without really thinking about my electability, but really on principles. And we in the six years that I was on council um, together with, you know, the movements in the city we made some real significant changes, especially around policing. And that, um, that sort of woke the sleeping giant um, that never was really asleep, but it got them to, to sit up and take, um, take notice and actually start getting involved. So this is, um, and the, the realtors, like that article in the journal Sentinel um, yesterday about all of the the outside investors gobbling up all the real estate in Milwaukee, um, like that that is real and that's devastating. And I, like we we watched this film. Have you guys seen this film called Growing Up Milwaukee? Um, it really just devastating about you know kids growing up in Milwaukee and every single one of those kids their trauma was a part of their traumatic uh, growing up was evictions and non-renewals. So this, it just touches everything. And, you know, the thing that Grant was mentioning about TIF money for parking garages and the zoning change that, you know, our Mayor Satya um, is, she just has her, P, her PR machine going 24 seven about it. Um, and it really is, unless we educate ourselves and each other, and support the folks who have a decision to be bold um, and to really make go boldly against um, what looks like just sort of a, a banal, like, oh, just some language in our zoning code. But really what it's gonna do is like overnight um, print money for landowners who, who own land in sp these specific districts that are gonna all of a sudden be able to build things by right that they haven't been able to do. Um, and displace a whole lot of people. So I'm sorry, I'm just scattered. Um, but uh, I also endorse, you know, what Grant was saying. We've been talking in Madison about having like a left, um, a left convention of all of these different parties that we have in Madison to really unify um, and put a, a shared agenda forward and, and get mass movement behind it. Um, so I, I'm kind of proud to say that in, 
my opponent did basically just a smear campaign full of lies against me. But one of the smears I'm proud to say was that I voted for Jill Stein in 2016. <laughs> and so, but the way he spun it in his literature was, you know, basically she voted for Jill Stein in 2016 and therefore she is responsible for Trump. Also, she hates police and like just just crazy. Um, but anyway, glad to be here with you all. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, it's great to have you here. And yeah, I just have to say, uh, you know, the amount of dark money, the coordination by reactionary, the most reactionary forces in our community uh, like literal right-wing oligarchs, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the police fraternity, um, all the, the dark money and smear campaigns. Um, and basically, you know, one of the key reasons being that Rebecca led the way on these very basic police oversight measures um, you know, and this is at a time when police are continuing, you know, to kill kids uh, around the country and it, it's headline news. And yet it feels like the local media is completely ignoring, uh, you know, what happened with this election. And I find that mind boggling. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you, Rebecca. And, you know, thanks for all your work. Um, and all right, so now uh, I know that Bill had a question that he's been waiting patiently to ask. And if anyone else wants to get on the stack, feel free. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Well, it was less of a question than an observation. Um, I know more about the election in Milwaukee than in Madison, but I just wanted to comment on the his to kind of put the um, the election in his historical perspective. Um, John Goethe, Milwaukee's historian, noted in the newspaper that this was the first time since 1956 that socialists had put up a slate in the election. And um, really, if you think about it, Alex got 45% of the vote. The average between the three candidates and, the, and, and two of the three candidates were African-American was about 45%, which was just a phenomenal victory. And as we just as we saw dark money uh, rise up in, in the Madison election and a, uh, a hit job on Alex in the, in the, uh, in the newspaper, uh, I think in the future, we're gonna be seeing what they saw back in the late 19th century and early 20th century in the state, and that is fusion candidates. The, uh, the populists and then later the socialists were so powerful, the workers and farmers and their allies, that the Democrats and Republicans had to get together and stand unified capitalists. So uh, the idea of a, um, or unified candidates, the idea of a left unity conference in Madison sounds great, but we're already seeing a capitalist unity conference going on, ongoing. I mean, they, they consider us a threat. And they're right. Pass. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, so does anyone want to piggyback off of that or you know, bring another um, question or comment up? Uh, Tessa, go ahead. Um. Yeah, I was just going to say in terms of moving forward, you know, I love this idea of the of a left unity conference. I think that uh, it makes no sense for the Greens, Progressive Dane, and the DSA to be like three different siloed um, organizations that don't talk to each other and support each other. Um, and also linking that to uh, grants and Brian's comment earlier of, uh, we put in all this collective work to elect people and then we say, good luck. <laughs> um, and what we need to do is, is continue to tie in and, and build those movements. So I know in DSA, we've been talking about what are like three key issues that are going to come in front of city council this next year that relate to the organizing we're already doing in our chapter and how can we um, funnel around that, right? Like we saw outpourings of the county board for the stop the new jail, right? Or we see every once in a while, like how do we preempt that instead of just going and commenting 
public comment at the meeting, how do we look at helping candidates draft proposals, look at concepts and like do some of that background research, write the articles for the newspapers, like publicize things um, ahead of time. Cause I think it's hard um, to actually enact change by just, I mean, it's helpful to go and comment at public meetings for sure, but you can come and tell you public meeting, most people have probably already made their decision by the time you're at the vote meeting and you need to be getting in at the committee level or like before the proposals actually happen um, to really like work towards changing them. Um, and so I'd be very excited to look at, at, at coordination there and, and between Madison and Milwaukee, right? There's no reason. We live in the same state. We have the same restrictions on the state level of what we can do city-wise. There's no reason we, there shouldn't be coordination. Um, there and I'd be really excited to help work on, on building that pass. Yeah, thank you, Tessa. Uh, so I think um, Barbara is on the stack, uh, Barbara Dahlgren, and then I see Greg. Go ahead, Barbara. Yeah, thank you all so much for, for making this meeting. I think that this is a great conversation to have right now. We have a little while until elections come up again, but we are, as you all were saying, we have just a, a continuous fight all year round um, every year. And often I think about how we have to prioritize the kinds of actions that we want to do so that we don't burn out, but also that we get some real major accomplishments um, actually done um, and, and a lot of attention on certain issues. Um, so I wanted to ask two things. One is um, for those of you who were not able to win this race, are any of you already thinking about 2022? And uh, if you might like to run for an office um, in 2022, and also what kinds of campaigns are you thinking about uh, issue campaigns at kind of the top of your mind as some of the most um, important and salient issues right now for either the local community or something that um, you think that statewide would be really important for us to be working on past? All right. Um, so do any of our candidates want to speak to that quickly before we uh, go to the next question? You can also marinate on that while we go to the next question and then people can answer uh, when they like. So why don't we hear from Greg? I was going to slip in one real thing quick if I can, Dave. Yeah, go for it. Um, I won't answer the question about uh, running in 22, but um, in terms of big issues, I feel really strongly that land ownership, this whole, like everything that we've been talking about here, it's not, it's not even like a random amalgamation of enemy forces. Like it is, it is real estate and people that own land. Um, so I just want to, I want folks to really focus on it and start paying attention to it. It's not a coincidence that that's where the money came from in these dark efforts. I mean, the police unions, yeah, but not like, honestly, that's not a ton of money. Most of the money is coming from people that own land and that want to speculate in land ownership and trade. And the relationship between that and housing is just super essential. So I just want to highlight that for everybody. Really, really start thinking about that and pay attention because as Rebecca said, what's happening in Milwaukee with out of state, out of country folks, that same thing is on the verge happening here in Madison as well. And it's, it's happening across the world. So land within cities is getting bought up by people with huge amounts of capital. And it's a real, real problem. Yeah, thanks for spotlighting that. That's just recently come on my radar. And it, you know, it definitely connects a lot of dots about all these people in our, you know, in my generation who are like, oh, I, now I'm close to being able to buy a home. Oh, no, not going to happen. Um, yeah, it's wild. Uh, so, Greg, go ahead. Yeah, just to, uh, continue on that thread. One of the things Howard Schweitzer told us to do if we felt comfortable was to contact our sheriff and encourage the sheriff to 
not enforce foreclosures, especially during the pandemic. But um, he felt that, you know, coming from the Greens National Financial Committee, uh, that was a recommendation. And um, also, you know, as far as getting people involved and, and learning what's going on in the community, a couple of years ago, we talked about how in the past, when the newspapers were the main source of education for folks about what was going on, and they were owned by the oligarchs, what they decided to do, people like us, was send teachers out into the community, out into the country actually, and uh, educate the people about what was going on in a door-to-door -door way. So we've been doing that in Milwaukee for the past couple of years, just a small group of us, Tom and I mostly, but some other people have joined us from time to time. And um, it's pretty effective to go knock on doors. We targeted uh, areas that voted for uh, conservative Supreme Court justices and went to those areas and educated people about the Green New Deal. So just some comments, I'll pass. Well, thanks, Greg. <laughs> Um, so it looks like we're on the stack. I'm sorry, Dave, I didn't hear you. Was that um oh, go ahead, Brian. stack? Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to piggyback on a couple of thoughts, but first I wanted to give a shout out to my alder, uh Marsha Ramo, who joined us. Uh, so uh Marsha uh there's going to be a very emotional meeting next Tuesday as Marsha and Rebecca and uh, the outgoing alders leave and us new ones are sworn in. But uh, my role model is with us now, so uh, Marsha might have some perspectives. But I, I just wanted to touch on, piggyback on something Tessa said earlier that really resonated with me, that some of the issues that we're talking about regardless if it's police reform or environmental injustices and the list goes on, that these are really difficult issues for so many people. And, you know, my day job, I'm a social worker. So we're always taught to uh, try to uh, check our own biases, to build rapport, to listen, to educate and to advocate. And I feel like this service is going to be a lot of that as we open doors for people to uh, really consider things that in the past, perhaps uh, we just couldn't, uh, you know, there's that saying being woke, that uh, as more people are woke and taking a look at these issues uh, to educate others. So, you know, locally, uh, we have PFAS in our water and Rebecca has been a champion for water rights and many others. And uh, uh, we just read in the paper today that they're going to start construction. Uh, once again, $9 million to build this F-35 flight sim simulator and uh, all of these crazy things. So as we engage people to talk about these issues, maybe for the very first time, some people are considering it. And uh, it, 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 it isn't really a leap of faith when you can uh, demonstrate uh, the public, the greater public good, if we can really dig down and explore these issues, uh, saving human carnage that our prison industrial system locks up so many people, the, you know, military industrial system that these uh, F-35s that cost over $80 million uh, during this time of a pandemic, what we could do with that money, and even before the pandemic. So, you know, that's the, that's the trick, I think, as we move forward to try to educate others uh, over these really emotional and very important uh, topics. And uh, what Tessa said earlier, it reminds me, I had an opportunity to meet with a representative for our local utility, Madison Gas and Electric. And uh, that was the first thing I said. Uh, they, uh, I, I would like to take over MG&E, and you should have seen the look on this person's face and uh, the other people in the room. Uh, so, you know, those are really, really, uh, as we move forward and forge a new future out of this pandemic, we have to have these very important conversations. 
So that's where we all play in. That's where we all talk to our neighbors, our friends, and other people around. And, and you know, Grant, and I saw something in the chat when we talk about land and uh, affordable housing. I, I bristle sometimes when I hear the word affordable housing because what's the true definition for thousands of people that I serve of if you're paying over 50% of your income, rather than just say, could we create housing based on your income, true affordable housing. So, you know, uh, Grant had mentioned uh, some of the zoning changes and a lot of it is smoke and mirrors because what's lacking in a lot of these, a lot of these conversations as we pursue uh, educating others is the visceral reality, we're lacking the truth, we're lacking truth that uh, if we truly wanna end housing disparities and housing insecurity, we can't depend on any benevolent developers. We can't depend on the real estate association. That's just not gonna happen. So as policymakers, we have to push that we have to subsidize. We have to recognize that housing is a human right. So there's a lot of work that's gonna uh, happen over the next two, four, plus years, we've been fighting some of these battles. Uh, well, for all of my life, uh, these things have been going on. So that's where we really need everyone to come together. Pass. All right, thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention, um, so it is 1.35 and um, we are uh, hoping that uh, Winona LaDuke will join us soon. Um, this is such a great discussion that uh, it feels like, um, you know, we should basically keep it going until that time. I just wanted to mention that um, because I do want to keep this going, but then, you know, once Winona joins, we want to, um, you know, make sure that we um, are able to, you know, respect her time as well. So, um, and also if, if folks need to take a bio break or anything like that, I'd say feel free. Um, and if folks would like to, you know, hang out and keep the discussion going, then let's do that. Um, okay, so I, I see Alex and uh, Benji are on the stack. So um, why don't we hear from Benji real quick, because I don't think uh, they've spoken yet. And then uh, Alex. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, my apologies, I keep going in and out. Um, so I'm just gonna keep my video off. To keep, uh, in the interest of internet connectivity. I um, also wanted to, to ask the question that, that Tessa began with, of what is a movement candidate, right? The only reason I ran was because A, uh, the incumbent was fundamentally making a lot of decisions that were causing a lot of harm in my community. And that has been a very difficult thing to accept, the fact that he's going to continue to make these very disastrous uh, decisions on, on behalf of the city that are going to continue to push people into homelessness, that are going to continue to push people into very uh, desperate places. But B, I think I also ran because I, I fundamentally believe that at a certain point, the movement needed somebody to, to say, somebody is doing it. Somebody is in that role and trying to do it. Um, and it points to a conversation that I've been trying to have with people and in other endorsed orgs of the fact that we need organizers in office, right? I know that Grant kind of talked about it earlier. The fact that Grant is somebody in the inside doesn't have those mechanisms to get these decisions um, and meeting agendas out to the community. And fundamentally that is a, a failure of American democracy because yeah, I mean, it, it points again to the, that intentionality of it. So some of the lessons I'm walking away with is um, the dark money and where do they will come out of the woodwork to put their, their money down or their thumb on the scale. Um, but also the fact that this gave a lot of hope to people. Um, the campaign gave a lot of time and space to ideas that are brewing in the city that have never been publicly entertained right now we are in a city that will have discussions about abolition and I don't think that that is any small thing to to balk at I think that uh, especially considering that 
the white silent majority came out in this election as well, uh, it tells me that there's just a lot of consciousness building that needs to happen for folks to actually become aware, for folks to actually start to, to care about some of these things. Um, and with that, I'll pass. But thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and Dave, just cut me off when, um, when Winona joins the program and I'll, that'll be fine. Um, so I want to respect her time as well. The, uh, um, the, to Barbara's uh, question about um, specific things to do now after this election, um, you know, some of the things I'm considering that I think that we should be taking up as the left in Wisconsin are um, going after the utilities. Um, and I brought it up in my remarks, but one of the things, you know, there are several statutes that allow for municipal ownership or municipal takeovers of utility infrastructure. Um, and uh, chapter 197 is one of them. Uh, chapter 198 is also one of them too, although that's that's two municipalities in combination can take over a utility and form a, a, form a separate government entity that, that, uh, that uh, administers a utility that would be publicly owned. Um, and, uh, and there's actually another provision within the um, within chapter 66 too, uh, somewhere buried in there. I don't remember the specific citation, but it uh, so there's multiple avenues legally that exist on the statutes right now for municipalities to take over their utilities. And what I mean by that is they would use eminent domain to um, purchase the utility infrastructure and then operate those that infrastructure as a municipal utility. Um, the largest one in the state being being Manitowoc. So that's something I'm thinking about and toying with that idea. I think it's a great idea to push, you know, the ideas of the left um, because it really represents democratic control of, of infrastructure that we all use. So I think it's a good issue that meets a lot of our benchmarks for is this going to spread socialism and spread the ideas of the left. Um, and also we can, you know, push the Green New Deal locally with something like that. Um, I don't want to ramble on too much about that. I just, I'm really a big fan of it. I think it might be a way for us to, um, we got, it might be a way for us to really create um, and show the divide that exists between the elites and regular people. Because most regular people think utilities are garbage. Um, and most people in elected office think utilities are great. <laughs> so we need to show the public that divide so that they will understand that when they go into the ballot box, they can't just cast a ballot for their aldermen because they like them. That there is an ideological difference between them and their aldermen and anybody who represents them. Um, to the other point about communal ownership of property, I'd like to share this story. Um, I was involved with a group of folks looking to start a business, a credit union um, in the 53212 zip code a number of years ago. Um, Actually, that was the focal point of the hit piece of the Journal Sentinel about me, but I was involved with a group that was trying to start a credit union and we went down, um, we went up and down this one street in the, in the uh, central street in the area that we were trying to start this credit union. We went to every abandoned building um, and we wrote a letter to the owner of every abandoned storefront to consider, to ask them to consider housing our credit union there and to start a conversation about leasing that property with only one exception with only one exception, every single property owner that, who responded back to us and who we met with was interested not only in like um, having us pay the full price of all the remodel of their abandoned crumbling storefront, but then also charging us a market-based rent after we paid for the cost of the remodel. And how is that relevant to communal ownership? Well, I'm saying that because if all of the commercial property was held in communal ownership, there would be a, in here, Milwaukee, well, let me contextualize a little bit by saying this, you guys, if, if any of you go come down here to Milwaukee, you know that like we have abandoned storefront after abandoned storefront in some parts of town and it, and it degenerates these neighborhoods. It, it, it's not a good, it's not a good look. People don't want to live in a neighborhood where you're living, living next to an abandoned storefront. Right. But I can tell you from that experience of trying to occupy one of these empty storefronts in Milwaukee, that these landowners are sitting on these properties waiting for the neighborhood to become gentrified so they can flip it to somebody else. And so if we had a more communal structure of ownership and decision-making about what happens to those storefronts, we would have a situation where all of these neighborhoods that are right now in disrepair would be vibrant in Milwaukee. You know, we have a situation like at 35th and Burleigh here in Milwaukee where every other building is abandoned because I suspect somebody is holding that property and sitting on it waiting for 35th and Burleigh to become gentrified so they can flip it to a new owner or develop to a developer. 
So I just wanted to address those two things. I'm, I'm sorry I went over time. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so I see Andrea on the stack. Just to follow up, is are there any statutes anywhere that you know of in the U.S. Um, in terms of limiting the uh, ability of a landowner to have empty property, abandoned, not unused? It seems like that's such a huge issue. Pass. Uh, Tessa? Um, I, someone else may be able to better answer that question. I know that places like um, Vancouver and some larger cities have implemented vacancy taxes in which if you leave a house or commercial property vacant, you get charged um, and have taken, specifically in Vancouver, BC, they've raised a lot of money that way and then have taken that to buy land and start to build affordable housing. Um, Oh yeah, Rebecca just put in the chat, their vacancy taxes. We don't have one in Madison. I don't, I'm not sure about Milwaukee. Um, and I do know that there are sometimes state laws that prohibit, like I wanted to do public internet, but there's a lot of laws at the Wisconsin state level um, that actually prohibit you from being able to do free public internet. You can do public internet, but it has to cost the same as the market, uh, other internets, right? Um, so. There's a lots of different levels, but uh, I just wanted to um, link back since we seem to have some time into talking about um, supporting Canadians and moving forward. And I know that someone asked a question like, are you thinking about running and what would you do between now and um, when you run, if you're running again? Uh, I think we need candidates, right? We need people who are willing to put themselves forward. Um, and run as independents or run as greens and run as socialists. And that, that need will always be there. But we also need people who are willing to database manage for them. We also need people who are willing to like run campaigns <coughs> to continue this institutional knowledge. Um, and for me personally, that's, that's the role I would rather play. I only ran because I couldn't find anyone else to run. Um, and I thought that there needed to be a challenge. And so uh, I think there, it, more, people are more willing to run if they know that there's a team that's going to support them um, while they do that. But I see other people are in stack now. I'll pass. Okay, thanks, Tessa. Um, yeah, I, so what I wanted to say is following up on an earlier point about, um, you know, all the, uh, all the challengers that we had, and, you know, folks thinking about possibly running again. And um, I really wanted to sparkle that because, um, you know, what we've seen in a lot of years in local elections is that many, if not most of the races are uncontested. And this year felt like a big change from that where most of the races were contested. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there were a lot of people with deep roots as grassroots activists, um, you know, who were really bringing up important issues. Um, and then, of course, <laughs> reading the Cap Times, uh, they do the classic liberal thing where it's like, well, both candidates are progressive. So, uh, you know, and just like... Uh, sort of disappearing all the actual issues that there's actual disagreement on. Um, but anyway, not to digress there, uh, the, I, I think what's really encouraging about that is just the fact that there is competition. Um, it shows the incumbents that, um, you know, people are paying attention and watching them and they can't just kind of go along with whatever the power brokers want um, because sure that, you know, they may have won this election, but uh, it, it kind of puts them on their toes a little bit more uh, because, uh, you know, it, people can hold their feet to the fire if, uh, you know, they're not shaping up on, on some of the issues that were brought up 
by, you know, the candidates who we supported. And I, I think, you know, another thing that was so unfortunate is there, there was so much energy last summer with the uprising. Um, and I think that translated into more candidates, but because of the pandemic, people weren't able to do the door to door, face to face conversations. And that has always been, you know, the number one tool for grassroots progressive candidates. Um, so it just felt like such a steep wall to climb. And meanwhile, you had, you know, dark money pouring in against progressive candidates, uh, you know, buying all these ads and, and, you know, deceptive campaigns and stuff like that. So in many ways, it was a very tough year for progressives. Although, you know, we still had some good results, but, you know, I, I feel like if folks are able to run again and, you know, keep, you know, keep building, uh, you know, get these coalitions together and, you know, maybe run again in two years, um, then, you know, we can really start to uh, get better and better results. And I was encouraged that people voted um, not to reduce the size of the city council overwhelmingly. Um, and I think that shows that people really do value grassroots politics that we have, and we got to build on that. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass this to Grant and Benji and Greg. Uh, go ahead, Grant. Thanks, Dave. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm super supportive of um, animating folks to run for sure. I mean, there is a lot of power, you know, in those seats. Um, on the flip side, I just really want to call out how impotent <laughs> the council is uh, in so many ways and how much power is not even being experienced there. And I just want to caution folks to not put too much hope and expectation in electoral politics. And that's coming from a politician speaking to people at a political party gathering. Um, so yeah, like it's a, you know, it's a both and thing, but I'm just going to tell you from the inside, there is so, we, we need, Rebecca put a link probably way up in the chat um, that folks should really check out, but we, we cannot, it doesn't, you can get people elected into those seats. If we do not have power and energy coming from the public, like on a wide scale, on every issue that you care about, the stuff's not gonna go the way you want it to go. So I just really like, you, you can't just get people elected and then like stuff will work because so much of the decisions, so much of the, of the power shifting hands is, is happening outside of those spheres. And it's, it really is going to, the, the true answer is having people on an ongoing basis, paying attention, organizing, speaking up. And in many ways, I think if and when that happens to a greater scale, you're going to have the people inside there that are then willing to run for those seats, get elected, do sort of the final step and making the vote that needs to happen. But getting folks elected without that base, without that active participation from the community is it's a it's a losing battle I'm, I'm just telling you that because i feel it on an ongoing basis so please focus right now about understanding what those priority issues are like somebody else said today and like work them on a, on a weekly basis honestly like connect with others keep talking about them keep organizing talk with a whole bunch of people and show up and give your thoughts because you can't just wait for the next election cycle it's 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 much much deeper and wider bases needed than that yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Grant. Um, so uh, I didn't mean to skip Barb. So uh, Barb is next. And um, yeah, so um, and I also wanted to mention that, you know, we um, we know that Winona was at a, a funeral and, you know, was hoping to join us afterwards. And it's possible that that has gone long. So um, yeah, so we're not sure what exactly the status is right now. Hopefully, uh, she'll join us sooner or later. Um, but I just wanted to keep folks updated on that. Um, we might have to rearrange the schedule a little bit, but it does seem like, um, you know, we have many of our guest speakers uh, on with us. So we should be able to do that. Um, all right. So, uh, Barb, you're up. Yeah, I wanted to respond to Andrea about um, kind of the tools 
to um, really, you know, do, do the things that we need to do with policy in order to, you know, deal with homelessness, deal with vacant properties, um, you know, make things happen in our communities. And I really appreciate what Grant is saying that like, if the movement's that not there, if the energy's not there, it's really going to be difficult to get things done. But if the people are there, um, I wouldn't just take no for an answer from my local government. We have rules that in this state and many others that say that the local politics can't really supersede the state politics, that whatever the state law is, is, is um, the bigger law or whatever the federal law is. But the community rights movement and the rights of nature movement have really pushed back against that, especially with fracking and other sorts of issues like that. But there's really no reason why we can't um, piggyback off of that kind of a movement in order to work on housing issues and work on all of these other really important issues as well. Um, and just say, we're the community, we need to do what we need to do and get it done, um, whether or not the state says it's okay, or, you know, passing the buck on to these other kinds of leaders. There's so many times where a local government, local officials are like, well, I don't know if we can do that. This is not um, a situation where, where people should be asking for permission uh, for basic things like clean water or housing for people or, you know, any of our necessities. So it shouldn't be a question of whether or not we can house people in our own community or whether or not we can have clean water. We do what we need to do to protect our people and get things done. So um, I, I would welcome other people to think about the community rights and um, rights of nature movements as ways in order to get those things done locally, even if there are standing rules on other levels that say, oh, you can't do that. Because I, I just don't think that it's, um, that it's just not serving us. And it's more democratically fair if we work on the local level when we need to pass. Yeah, thanks, Barb. Um, so next up was uh, Benji. I'm gonna try with my video, see if the internet doesn't cut out. Um, but I really wanna highlight some of what comrades have been saying, right? Of the fact that um, the work isn't all electoral. It's not. It doesn't matter how many people are super sympathetic or unsympathetic with housing, with police brutality, it's going to keep happening. Um, and so what do we start to do as people on the left, as people trying to change the world to make sure that coalition is built around these, these issues and that the people who are brainstorming and on the front line and engaging with this work are able to take their messaging, their belief, their solutions into the electoral realm. How do we start to, we as Greens build that coalition with those folks on the ground? I, I don't want, want to suggest that the Greens should invest in the capacity or even frankly has the capacity to do some of this like mutual aid to provide comrades with a space to have revolutionary thinking and conversation. Um, but it is a way that we as folks in, from various different walks of life can actually start to turn around and provide support where it's needed, where it actually needs to happen. Um, and I think that, that frankly, that uh, in looking at the movement and in looking at different leftist spaces, the the conversation isn't bold enough, right? I really like what, what Barbara was saying of um, moving past and learning to say no when we hear no. It's like no, no, you're wrong. You know, like I, I think of the the um, the bus boycotts. People are like people said no, and you said you know what? We're gonna say no, but I don't see that happening. In Wisconsin, I don't see these these fundamental, radical, and frankly, really collective movements happening because there isn't that that collective identity, there isn't that collective demand, um, and we should be starting to organize around those very specific things. 
to be able to get what we want and then to be able to push candidates forward when we see that there's an opportunity for me like my whole campaign was running was ran on defunding the police it was defund the police refund the community and house everybody um and i didn't care like the <laughs> the camp times gave me uh didn't choose to give me the endorsement because they saw me as the defund the candidate, the police candidate. And they said, Oh, well, you got good ideas on demilitarizing the police, but it's not a priority in the city. So we're not going to give you the endorsement and things like that. But now it's again in the conversation. Now I can coalesce and network with all of y'all, um, with all of the other orgs and then keep moving past. Yeah. Thanks, Benji. Um, so let's see. Um, We've got uh, Greg and Joe Nathan and Brian on the stack. And um, after that, we should probably move on to our uh, next guest speakers. Um, but yeah, um, let's, let's keep this going. And like I said, we can try to be a little fluid with the schedule. And also as always, if, if folks need to take a little bio break, uh, feel free. Um, so, um, Greg, you're up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, comment about what Dave was saying and tell a little story about um, my experience going door to door in December. Um, the virus did not stop people in Georgia from going door to door. And I thought it was a really good opportunity to educate people about the Green New Deal. And my son lives in Georgia. And he was going to be in Upper Michigan, so I knew I'd have a bed in Georgia. So I thought, oh, it'll be a great little vacation. I can do some door-to-door -door for the Green New Deal. So I did, and they had rules like you had to wear a, a mask, and you couldn't touch the person's house with your hand. You had to, like, wear a glove to do it. But they were doing door-to-door -door on a massive scale for the Senate race, Senate races. And... Um, we can do the same thing here. You know, we can sh we can show um, you know respect for health by wearing masks and and go door to door. Um, so that is open again, I believe, in Wisconsin is what I wanted to say. Pass. Thanks, Ray. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay, I, I have to take some ownership here. I was sort of the organizer that reached out to Winona LaDuke and um, she, she yes, does have a funeral happening this day and it, it's a little more complicated perhaps. Um, she's midday, the Religious Society of Ojibwe and uh, as am I. And um, she may be officiating the funeral. So when you're sitting in the lodge or dealing with a large group of people, it's real hard to whip out your cell phone for... 10 or 15 minutes. So she sincerely co committed to try to be here and, and is uh, positive and, and uh, thinking good thoughts for us. Uh, she, she imparted that to me as well. So um, she may show up at any time, just pop into virtual reality presence. And um, she, I invited her to do that. Uh, I hope that she can still, but I feel the quality of the conversation is filling in quite well. And I appreciate your patience. And uh, I just had to notice, notify everybody of, of that status. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that update. Um, yeah. And I see Tessa has to run. Thank you so much, Tessa. Um, and I think Brian was, was next. And uh, then we uh, can turn it over to our next guests. Uh, Brian, go ahead. Thank you. I, I won't be long. And we're all taking time out of our, you know, it's beautiful out here in Madison on a Saturday. So I had mentioned the notion of being woke and I'm making the assumption that everyone who took time out today really cares about these issues and really cares about building capacity to make the green stronger. So I wanna just issue just a, another clarion call why your involvement here today and in the past and in the future is so important. So as we talk about all of these major issues, some that we touched on, housing is a human right, clean air and water, environmental injustices, as we talk about um, uh, reimagining public safety and 
ending uh, the systemic racism and oppression and poverty and many other things that are in our midst that many of the people that I serve as one of the BIPOC candidates uh, running, uh, one of many, uh, many of the folks in my orbit, many people that I serve, many people that uh, navigate within my reality, they're, they're struggling to put food on the table or how they're gonna keep a roof over their head or the deepest concerns about their children, trying to avoid visceral violence and trauma, all of these things that prohibit them from being involved right now in some of these discussions. So you are paving the way, you're leading the, the charge that we can get systems in place where other people can get involved and can uh, uh, take lot in their own lives. So I, I wanna thank you all. Uh, and I don't know many of you personally, but uh, just the fact that you're here is very inspirational. So please keep that in mind as we talk about growing a movement, growing the party, of growing capacity to fight some of these societal woes that there's so many people that are paralyzed right now and they just can't. So uh, the fact that you're woke and you're uh, spending time today and all the good deeds that you do in your communities is really laying a foundation that when we do uh, put some systemic changes in place that can open doors for other people, then we'll see the movement grow. So thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, this has been a fantastic discussion. Um, and uh, I know that, you know, uh, some folks have to go. Um, you know, I, we really appreciate people taking time out of their busy schedules, uh, calling in from wherever they are uh, to join us. Um, so I, um, before uh, everyone heads out, I do wanna make a quick plug. Uh, as we've mentioned once before, um, everything that we do is supported by our dues paying members. So please consider becoming a member today or renewing your membership. Um, you know, we don't take a penny of corporate money and we never will. That's what makes the Green Party different. Um, and the, uh, the more members, uh, the that we have, the more that we can grow. And the other thing is, I would say, uh, you know, folks who are members and want to get more involved, please consider um, self-nominating for one of our committees. And uh, that's where a lot of work gets done. And that also helps us to build capacity so we can support more. I mean, after hearing from these candidates, you want to elect more of these candidates, right? And I know it's not just about elections, um, you know, we have movements to build as well and coalitions to build with allies. So please um, consider, you know, becoming a member and getting more involved. Um, yeah, so next up, uh, so the today's theme uh, that we chose is a party for working people. Um, you know, we've all seen how working people have really been getting the short end of the stick. Um, for decades, but especially in the past year, while uh, billionaires made billions more, uh, so many people are struggling, and uh, you know the change is not coming from the top. Um, you know, and even you know some people thought maybe structural change was coming to help working people, and we're not seeing it yet. So. Um, we you know really wanted to highlight that today and so uh we have our two guests uh warren enstrom uh from milwaukee dsa and the labor solidarity coalition uh sorry if i um didn't get that quite right but uh you know and, and a successful union organizer um which is a huge topic in the news right now with everything happening with amazon and collectivo and everything uh, and also Mike McAllister will be talking with us about the anti-racist Green New Deal. Um, yeah, so welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'd like to hand it over to uh, Warren to start off. Thank you, Dave. Um, yeah, so my, my background is 
not particularly in labor. Um, I, I've long been interested in labor. Uh, I didn't grow up in a union family per se. My dad was in a union, but he's fairly conservative. So I got the, the other perspectives on what unions are good for, but it was really after I started learning about like the labor, the labor movement of the late 19th and early 20th century, um, that it really became clear to me that what organized labor was for was for building a better world. Um, and especially giving workers a say uh, in the place where, you know, we still spend a third of our lives, right? The old worker adage, eight hours for rest, eight hours for work, eight hours for recreation. Uh, it works out that a third of your life is spent at work. And in most workplaces, that's not under a democratically controlled system. You have to do what your boss is tell you to do. And if you don't, you're out on the street, basically. So uh, it's really interesting because I, I came to labor organizing uh, recently. So I work at the Milwaukee Art Museum as an AV technician. And I, uh, like many of my colleagues were affected by the pandemic and we were furloughed um, beginning in March in that same week that basically all the, the, the lockdowns and the quarantines and stuff began. And we, uh, we were just kind of thrown. It just kind of happened out of the blue like it did for everybody else. But there was a group of people who had already been working to organize the art museum who I didn't know about, uh, who created a Facebook group called MAM Helps. And what that was, was basically just like a community support page for people to voice their worries, their concerns, their, uh, their questions about having to apply for unemployment. And that's actually where I began to get involved with the union effort. Uh, I posted a series of videos uh, about how to apply for unemployment because our state's unemployment system is so uh, backwards <laughs> for lack of a, a better, softer word. Um, and so after I did that, I, I was approached by some of the people who had organized the group and we just started talking and I mentioned that I felt like we could benefit from having a union at the art museum. And from there, I, I joined the campaign. We started working uh, basically to reach out to, to other people in, in quiet to build a nice solid organizing committee. Um, and then we went public in August. Um, and we started signing cards like you do when you do a, a union drive and we pushed for voluntary recognition and the museum made it clear that they weren't gonna uh, recognize us. So we had to go for an election. Um, one of the things that really got me turned on to organizing that really gave me a hands-on feeling for what organizing was, was reaching out to my colleagues um, and having difficult conversations about what unions are, what they're good for and why, you know, we needed one at the art museum. And I remember one or two really difficult conversations about people who basically had no idea what unions were for and, you know, had some really tough questions about, you know, why would I support this? Like, how can we work through this? And it was very interesting because it, it for anybody who's knocked on doors or who's done that kind of like direct outreach work, um, you know, the kinds of questions you can get that completely throw you for a loop and make you have to reconsider your own positions and think about why you believe what you believe and why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and from there, uh, doing that work made me realize that, you know, if I can, if I can get this level of joy out of organizing a workplace, I can do this kind of work uh, politically, so, which is why I, I wound up getting involved with Maki DSA in particular. But um, Overall, the labor organizing changed my entire perspective on what political organizing can and should look like. Um, long story short, we wound up winning our election at the Milwaukee Art Museum with a 72% yes vote, which is a, an amazing mandate that I'm so proud of me and my colleagues for helping usher in. Uh, right now we're waiting, uh, we're not waiting, we're, we're, we're negotiating. We have our negotiations committee working with management to try and outline a first uh, contract for us to vote on eventually. We're, we're, we're doing the work. <laughs> so that's, that's about all, all I can say about that. Um, I, I 
maybe I can pass it along to the other the other panelists here, and we can form something of a a, a conversation here. Um, do you have anything you want to say, uh, Mike? Uh, this was uh, a fantastic effort you guys did. Uh, I can go ahead and should we take questions now or should should I get started? Why don't you get started, Mike? And uh, you know we can we can take questions after you you uh, say your intro. Okay, sure, no problem. Uh, hi, I'm Mike McAllister. Uh, I am a member of the uh, National Writers Union and an Ask Me retiree. That's my connection to the labor movement. Uh, but I'm sort of uh, here to talk about uh, what Greater Milwaukee Greens are, are, are uh, trying to do uh, in, in Milwaukee to uh, to build the anti-racist Green New Deal. Uh, so I want. So we'll start. I was a history major, so you, so everybody gets a, a history lesson while I'm here. <laughs> uh, the roots of our campaign for an anti-racist Green New Deal for Milwaukee started growing in the spring of 2019 when millions of young people across the planet joined the school strikes to fight climate change. In Milwaukee, thousands of students from grade school to college marched through the streets from City Hall to Water Tower Park in an amazing display of righteous anger. Uh, those of us with a little more experience in fighting for change had high hopes that this was the beginning of a struggle to protect the lives of humans and other species before the fossil fuels wiped us all out. Make no mistake, the stakes in this fight couldn't be any higher. Uh, we see the effects of burning fossil fuels every day. Those who doubt this reality will only be presented with more evidence in the coming weeks, months, and years. But what does this have to do with defending and expanding working people's rights? Uh, it's pretty simple. The human race is faced with just three choices to deal with global heating and the climate crisis it engenders. First, we can continue to do nothing and eventually prepare for the apocalypse. We can make the victims, the working people, the global poor and the global south pay to save the planet. Or we can make those responsible, the fossil fuel companies and their capitalist brethren pay for their crimes against all life. I'm kind of partial to that last solution. And it all starts where we live. Later this, later this afternoon, Howie Hawkins will likely tell you about his decade-long fight for a Green New Deal. And it's important to make that fight on the largest scale possible. Uh, please forgive me, but I'm going to invoke a pair of cliches that I apologize for in advance. But I'll note that truths are a defense. We're often told to think glo global and act local. And, and honestly, acting locally is an excellent way of breaking down a problem as gigantic as ending the burning of fossil fuels and making the solution seem more possible. We can seek to make changes on a million different local levels that begin to make a difference. But writing letters, dropping email blasts on your state legislatures or city council folks isn't going to work as long as the corporate parties dominate politics in this country. Cliche number two, Frederick Douglass continues to remind us that power concedes nothing without a demand. And demand is the word that we want to focus on. Writing letters, no matter how strongly worded, no matter how many mailboxes are filled, are just requests. Please, perhaps call to action, calls to action. But every marketing genius will remind you that to put a well-honed call to action on your website, because they can be ignored. Uh, as every time, as we see every time another black man is killed or paralyzed or otherwise wounded by an alleged good guy with a gun, movements in the streets make demands. May not always be granted but they have a much better chance of getting heard. 
To come back to 2019 and 2020, Milwaukee Greens were hopeful that a, the movement that began with the youth strikes would gain in numbers and momentum. We hope that a more powerful movement for a Green New Deal, a movement for a just transition that puts the interests of all, of all workers first while still ending the fossil-based economy would grow to be a political force at all levels of politics, a movement where our ideas about how to win this fight could get heard. As 2020 began, the Greater Milwaukee Greens made the building a movement for a Milwaukee-based Green New Deal, one of its annual goals. And as everybody knows, COVID hit. It was hard to build a movement on the streets while keeping ourselves at a safe distance from each other. While we continued to monitor the social climate for, for movement building, even as nature's case for stopping global heating got ever stronger, nothing happened in the fight for climate justice. In addition, our own resources weren't enough to get something started. But we continued to watch. Having seen hardly anything happening among the various local environmental organizations that we could relate to, uh, some of us start, started thinking about being the catalyst for this campaign that's so desperately needed. While we were waiting for someone else to get things started, perhaps others were waiting for someone to stand up and get going. So our outreach committee started meeting to brainstorm possibilities. We started with a Google Doc to brainstorm ideas in three main areas, demands, allies, and coalition partners, and the governmental targets that could grant our demands. Uh, let me share my screen and I can show you where that, where that document sits right now. Are you able to share your screen, Mike? I'm getting there. There we go. And, and here we go. Uh, is that visible? Yes. Excellent. So, uh, we looked, at, uh, we looked at the Hawkins Walker website to look for demands that we could localize. We started reading government reports tackling the climate crisis and its economic effects. We looked at movements and organizations that we've been involved with past and present. And we continue to look at the works of climate justice theorists and champions for bigger ideas and ways to explain to the people we want to bring into this movement. Here are, the, these are some of the demands that we've been, we've been uh, putting together. And yes, I was listening to uh, Alex before. So we, the, the lovely thing about a Google doc is that you can add stuff right away. So here we are. I, I'd already had the We Energies plank on there, mostly because of Alex's previous campaigns but now we have something to, something to research. We've been talking about all of these different things and uh, we hope to add to this soon. The second batch is, uh, is our allies and partners. Uh, we tried to identify people and organizations we could look to as coalition partners and other allies. As we bring together these forces, we can expand the scope of our demands and build a strategy to win them. We couldn't move forward uh, without recognizing that Greater Milwaukee remains a hypersegregated city with a police problem of, of its own. Where I live, the West Dallas Police Department has sent its bomb-proof personnel carriers uh, that they got from the military to every decent-sized demonstration in, against police violence last summer. So we knew from the start that we had to propose an anti-racist Green, Green New Deal that made demands echoing those communities of color. Uh, and that would include the, uh, the, the, fight that, uh, uh, the fight that has been waged uh, against 
uh, for police reform, for community control, uh, for getting the lead out of the uh, 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 out of the pipes in older in the older parts of the city, which, not so coincidentally, are uh, where uh, where people of color live are are segregated into. So those are uh, among the demands we need to we, but uh, we need to bring in more voices of people uh, of people people of color uh, into the coalition so we can make those demands uh, better and stronger. The socialist left in Milwaukee has shrunk in recent years, but we recognize that the left is often the heart of any progressive organizing effort. So we'll reach out. Uh, we were excited to learn that Milwaukee DSA ran candidates for school board demanding a Green New Deal for Milwaukee schools. And we will certainly be in touch. Uh, the labor, Obviously, environmental justice groups like 350 and, and, and the forces behind the climate strikes uh, are folks that we can relate to. We, uh, but we also want to talk to and about, uh, about labor, the labor movement and working people as a whole. Uh, the Milwaukee County Bus Drivers Union, the, uh, the Amalgamated Transit Union, has long had a reputation for fighting for justice. Uh, when Father Jim Grappi left the priesthood uh, after the uh, 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 after the uh, fight for open housing in Milwaukee that he led, uh, won its battles. When he left the priesthood, he got a job with the transit system and was elected president of the, of the transit union. It is also no accident that they hired one of their rank and file. Some uh, a, a driver named Angela Walker to their staff uh, after the Wisconsin uprising. Labor sustain for sustainability is a national organization of union members pushing their unions to advocate for a just transition. So we want to find out uh, find their members in the city and and greater and greater Milwaukee to. Uh, to become part of this and help us organize. And we're starting to get uh, pull together a list of religious organizations because we need a broad coalition. And, and the fight for living wage and climate justice uh, need help to get to the heart of this agenda. When we build the coalition, we expect that the coalition will determine a strategy for winning our demands. We need to understand what bodies make the decisions that will transform people's lives, as Tessa talked about earlier. So we've got a few. We'll be working on that list, too, as, as the coalition grows. While we've been educating ourselves by reviewing reports from the governor's task force on climate change uh, and a preliminary report from a joint uh, Milwaukee City County Legislative Task Force put together to look at local solution. We, we realized that by ourselves, we didn't know much about a variety of initiatives. So we're digging into the research. I hope that as political and social spaces expand this summer, we can begin taking our ideas for a set of demands to other organizations to create this coalition. We also think we're building a model for other local chapters of the Green Party to learn from. Uh, successes and mistakes, we're undoubtedly going to make some. We may help. We probably already have. We'll also glad, happily share our brainstorming document as it progresses. I'll even put a link in the chat uh, when I'm done here. If anyone enjoys reading academic and bureaucratic papers, we could use some more research hands too, by the way. We don't care where you live. <laughs> Uh, at, at the next spring, at the, uh, at the 2022 spring gathering, I'd like to be able to report that a coalition for an anti-racist Green New Deal has mobilized hundreds, if not thousands, 
uh, to march on local city halls with an effective program to fight the climate crisis through just transition. All working people will benefit and gain political power through those through uh, through that campaign. I'll close with cliche number three. I believe that we will win. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, all right, so why don't we open it up now to questions and discussion. And um, we have about 10 minutes until the next agenda item. So just be mindful of that. I, I see Bill and Andrea on the stack. Go ahead, Bill. Also, Mike, if you could stop uh, the screen share. Um, yes, there we go. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bill. Yeah, um, I want to thank Mike for his wonderful initiative on this, but I would direct my first questions to Warren. Um, you and your co-workers won your fight for a union at the art museum, but of course we know that workers don't always win in these organizing campaigns. Recently, um, there was a tie vote uh, it's still um, up for grabs as far as the uh, status of uh, things with the workers at Collectivo. An earlier effort by the Teamsters at Stone Creek was not successful. And there are ongoing uh, organizing campaigns in Milwaukee elsewhere. I wonder if you could comment on some of those. And then secondly, as uh, recently elected co-chair of the Milwaukee DSA, um, one of your responsibilities is, of course, uh, helping out with the, um, the national campaign the DSA has launched around the uh, Getting the Pro Act passed through Congress. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Pass. Certainly. Thanks, Bill. Um, I don't know if I can jump in here. That's the way we do it in DSA. But if we want to aggregate questions, we can do that. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, as Bill mentioned, there's a groundswell of labor organizing in Milwaukee right now. Uh, and, and, you know, with the Collectivo workers actually across the state between Milwaukee and Madison, as well as across state lines in Chicago. Um, as Bill said, that resulted in a tie vote, which is actually not completed yet. So the, the default when you do a labor election is that a tie vote is a loss for the union. You need a majority in order to win. However, there are, I believe... 16 unopened ballots that are going to a hearing on April 27th. And most of those ballots have been challenged by the employer. So they are likely yes votes. From what I understand, the union feels very good about that. So basically everyone's just holding their breath <laughs> until then. Um, in Milwaukee, we also had uh, Wonder State Coffee, formerly Kickapoo Coffee Company, company uh, win their union election and their their uh, coffee makers are now in negotiations with their management when their shop opens up again. Um, Voces de la Frontera, uh, which is a nonprofit here in Wisconsin aimed around immigrant rights and um, sort of organizing within the Hispanic uh, Latina community. Um, recently had some of its staff unionized and they were voluntarily recognized by management. So that was a win for labor in the state. Um, I'm trying to think of all the, all the little fights that are going on right now. There's, there's so many that are happening. Um, Marquette. Marquette. That's right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, the Marquette, uh, academic workers union is currently holding a series of actions basically to stop the, the university's just dedication to laying off its academic staff, particularly in the arts and humanities. Um, there's, they've been, they've been doing sit-ins, they've been doing occupations of the president's office, they stopped Wisconsin Avenue, and they actually have reduced the number of layoffs that the university has handed down by a large margin. I believe the latest number was that 39 people had been laid off, but it was much larger looking at around 90 or 100 before these actions were announced. At any moment that could change, of course, because they don't have a contract, um, which is the downside of not being a unionized worker, uh, management could just show up and do whatever they want. Um, 
but as Bill mentioned, you know, Stone Creek was sort of the first wave of organization in Milwaukee and Wisconsin recently, especially for service workers in an industry that is not traditionally unionized. And I think it's important, especially as we wait for the results of the collectible election to remember that a loss is not a loss, especially in a union vote. Um, especially in a union vote as close as Collectivo's was. You know, Stone Creek didn't get their union, but if they hadn't organized, uh, the Collectivo workers would never have thought about joining a union. So many of the organizers with Collectivo have said that Stone Creek was an inspiration to them. You know, it, 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 it hurts to lose, but there, there's always a silver lining there. Um, to pivot to Bill's second question, uh, basically Milwaukee, uh, not Milwaukee, National DSA has announced their campaign around the PRO Act, which actually comes in a greater grand scheme view of things from the Green New Deal. So the, the National DSA's framework is that we need, in order to get the Green New Deal passed, just like we needed to get the original New Deal passed, we needed um, militarized labor. So the PRO Act is the first step towards getting the Green New Deal legislation passed uh, in, in the US uh, uh, federal government. So um, what uh, National DSA is doing is holding phone banks. They've called over 500,000 people already in key states and they've already gotten an additional Senator to sign on to the PRO Act um, at the federal level. So we are four senators away from getting this legislation completely sponsored um, for more information about the PRO Act, basically it undoes a lot of what the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 did. So for those of you not in the know, the, the law that allows unions to be legal in the US is called the Wagner Act. It was passed in 1935 during the Great Depression. Prior to that, uh, all unions in the US were not protected in any way by the government. Um, what the Wagner Act did was legalize uh, and uh, really require the government, uh, require employers to speak to unions when they form in the workplace. It made them the de facto unit of organization of a workplace's workers. It provided a ton of great protections. It allowed protections for organizers to unionize shops. Uh, it protected workers who were trying to unionize. Uh, but then a lot of those protections were stripped away in 1947 with the Taft-Hartley Act. What the PRO Act does is restore some of those uh, some of those protections, not all of them, but but a good deal. So it would strengthen the labor situation in the U.S. very strongly. The U.S. is it's almost impossible to form a union. So when you look at votes like Stone Creek and possibly Collectivo, if it goes south, um, remember that the fact that they got as close as they did is a miracle in this country where labor is so antagonized. One of the most important things the PRO Act does is uh, prevent uh, what are called captive audience meetings where management just sits you in a room and they hire some guy in a suit to tell you about why unions are bad for you and why you should vote no and lightly imply that, you know, if you don't vote no, you might lose your job, which is illegal, but uh, management doesn't care. They have the money to pay for the fines. So that's one of the best things that the PRO Act will do uh, among a ton of other really great stuff. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Um, so uh, Andrea's on the stack. Go ahead, Andrea. Yeah. Typing up a few notes. Thanks. Well, so I have kind of a specific question and, and uh, Mike, I'm sorry if I missed I missed uh, something you might have said uh, dealing with this, but um, in terms of the Green New Deal in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, one thing that seems like it could make a make a real difference, maybe not the biggest difference, um, is you know to increase electric vehicle usage. And when we were looking into getting an electric car. Wisconsin was actually a place where um, it, it was debatable. I think it was even actually a net negative environmentally to use, to have an electric car rather than, for example, a hybrid, that the, the electricity we get is so dirty that um, gas is actually, 
at the moment still, well, at that moment, a couple of years ago, the better, the cleaner option. So is it, I realize that's very specific, but is there anything that, uh, that you're looking to change on that score? Pass, thanks. So uh, we're, transportation is, a, is, an important, is an important vehicle, uh, pardon the pun, uh, uh, for, uh, in enacting a Green New Deal because obviously uh, a lot of fossil fuels are burned uh, in, uh, in transportation. Uh, like I say, we have not finalized a, finalized uh, a a set of demands, but one of the things that we're looking at, actually one of the things that we learned from the uh, from the the governor's task force report is that there actually are are such things as uh, electric buses, and so one of the things that we want to we want to talk about, or uh, that uh, that we have addressed in, in, in the demands. Uh, I'm not seeing it here, but uh, we'll cross. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, it, it is making a demand for that a certain amount of uh, uh, certain amount of, of new public buses uh, become uh, uh, they look for electric electric alternatives instead of instead of diesel and uh, whatever so-called clean energy that they're they're u using now. Uh, and one of the advantages of that is that indeed we'd be able to uh, uh, make those charging stations available to electric cars as well. I think, speaking strictly for myself, I think electric cars are a are a transitional solution. Uh, but I really think that you know we we need to, uh, as a permanent solution, make uh, public transportation, mass transit, uh, both intercity and uh, and uh, at a local level. Uh, I think that's a, that's a better solution for the planet in the long term. But uh, like I say, I, I think electric cars help people to understand uh, what uh, what what needs to happen. Pass. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, Warren. So. We actually are um, at the end of our time uh, for this discussion. Um, and yeah, really interesting stuff. And, um, you know, great to hear that there are so many union drives happening and, you know, there's some positive movement. And yeah, congratulations on, uh, you know, the Milwaukee Art Museum unionizing. That's an amazing victory. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, keep us posted. Um, and, you know, again, let us know, just like we're, uh, saying our, you know, we need to stay in tune with local government and, you know, in touch with our local elected officials about what we can do. Um, you know, we need to stay informed about how we can support these organizing drives and, uh, you know, really support the union movement. Um, and the same goes with the, with the Green New Deal. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, and so, uh, again, uh, people, if uh, you need to take a bio break or anything, uh, feel free. Um, this isn't a captive audience meeting, of course. <laughs> um, but there were uh, requests to have a Green Party 101 presentation um, so that, you know, people could get sort of an orientation and, uh, you know, some, some information on, you know, what is the Green Party and uh, what exactly are we, uh, what is this movement that we're building? So I agreed to do that. Um, and <laughs> it's the first time. Uh, so 
I, uh, I certainly hope that folks like it. And I am just looking for that presentation to launch right now. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. And then start the presentation. So let me know if folks are able to see this. We, okay, I see a thumbs up. Okay, welcome to Green Party 101. Quick guide to the world's fastest growing political party. Um, and we have a quote here from Petra Kelly, who is um, the famous uh, co-founder of the German Green Party. Uh, so let's start Green Party 101 with some history. Okay, so some of the forerunners to the Green Party um, were in Australia, in New Zealand, in Switzerland, uh, Britain, and Germany in the uh, sort of the early to mid 1970s. And uh, it's sort of disputed, but many people consider the Values Party of New Zealand sort of the first, um, you know, Green Party that. Uh, sort of really brought together the um, elements that we see today. The United Tasmania group uh, did become the Tasmania Greens and then the Australian Greens. And that was a very environmentally focused party. The Values Party um, brought in some of the social justice issues um, and sort of led to uh, the, the movement that we see today. So. What all these parties have in common is that they envision egalitarian, ecologically sustainable societies. And many of them started at the local level um, and uh, sort of grew from there. Oop. Okay, so um, a huge moment, the Green Breakthrough in Germany happened in 1983 when the German Green Party, which had been formed just a few years earlier, won 5.7% in a national parliamentary election and took 27 seats in the Bundestag, so they're equivalent to the House of Representatives. Um, so the German Green Party's politics were environmentalist, anti-war, anti-authoritarian, anti-nuclear, pro-immigrant, uh, pro-women's rights, and LGBT rights. Um, and their style was very different than other political parties at the time. They were known for protests, for civil disobedience, and some people called them the anti-party. Um, you know, they didn't always wear suit and tie. Uh, they, you know, really came out of the out of the social movements, and um, you know, there were from day one major disagreements about social movements versus electoral politics. Um, and so the German Green success inspired activists to start green groups around the world. And that includes the US, which we'll get to in a minute. Sorry to be skipping around. So, let's, but first let's talk about global greens today because this is a, a global movement and in many ways a global party. Uh, so today the Global Greens Network includes parties in 98 countries around the world. And uh, there are additional green parties that exist outside the Global Greens Network. Uh, some of them are just in formation. Other, there are others that are well established, uh, such as the parties of the Nordic Green Left. Uh, for example, the, the Prime Minister of Iceland is a member of the Green Left and um, the, uh, the party that just won the election in Greenland uh, is also part of the green left. So green parties are best known for their success in Europe, but greens have had some level of electoral success on every continent. Um, and due to that growing success in Europe, the proliferation of green parties around the world and internationalist cooperation between these parties. 
many consider the Green Party to be the fastest growing political movement in the world. So back to the Green Party US um, and the beginning. Uh, so it's hard to point to a single moment um, that was the beginning, but many people would point to 1984 when activists meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota formed the Green Committees of Correspondence. Uh, so that their name coming both from the German Greens and from the American Revolution uh, Committees of Correspondence. Uh, so there were early disagreements about electoral versus social movement strategies, and they were uh, basically resolved in com compromise decisions to pursue both. Uh, and the first Greens elected in the US were here in Wisconsin, uh, David Conley uh, to the Douglas County Board of Supervisors and Frank Keene, uh, Bayfield County Board of Supervisors uh, in 1986. And, yep. sorry, this is really um, jumping around. So um, a very quick electoral history of the Green Party US. So Greens have won over uh, 1,200 elections in the United States, um, which is the most success for an independent left party since the Socialist Party of Eugene Debs, um, and you know, which actually had some of its uh, most famous success in you know, the post-war era in Milwaukee. Um, so Greens have been most successful at the local level. Uh, for example, won city council seats in places like San Francisco, Boston, Minneapolis, Portland, Maine, Madison, and a lot more. Um, and a couple of well-known Green local elected officials include Jason West, who was elected mayor of New Paltz, New York, and was the first person in New York to perform same-sex marriages, uh, which was a huge step forward for uh, that movement, uh, as well as Gail McLaughlin, who was the mayor of Richmond, California, um, Bay Area city of 100,000 people. And uh, she's known for uh, major police reforms that dramatically reduced violence. Um, taxing Chevron, the major corporation that had you know, previously governed the city, uh, you know, saving green spaces from corporate development and um, probably most well known for attempting to ban foreclosures in the city of Richmond, um, which made national news and really scared the banks before uh, they were able to stop it. Um, it's especially interesting considering that, um, you know, many of these issues have come up earlier in the day, such as the idea of stopping foreclosures. Um, and we also have some serious obstacles to green electoral success in this country. Um, the majority of modern democracies use some form of proportional representation, where, for example, a party that wins 10% of the vote gets 10% of the seats. Uh, we saw it with the German Green Party, they were able to get in their national parliament with just over 5%. Uh, the US is among a handful of countries that use the obsolete first past the post voting system. Uh, that's widely considered by uh, experts to be the worst voting system there is uh, because you have single winner districts where the candidate with a plurality of votes gets the seat. So very often, um, you know, the winner doesn't even represent the majority of, of voters. Um, and it, it leads to all sorts of problems and uh, you know, generally an unrepresentative uh, government as we see today. Uh, ballot access hurdles were introduced during the red scares of the 20th century, um, targeted at parties like the Socialist Party of Eugene Debs, uh, but they've been uh, used against the Green Party and they're regularly increased by both Democrats and Republicans. Um, you know, we see even now with all the talk about uh, fighting voter suppression, you know, the Democrats have been increasing ballot access hurdles in states like New York. Um, and the, you know, political system and political culture revolving around the presidency and the uh, electoral college uh, really exacerbates a lot of these problems.
Okay. Um, so that was a little bit of history. Uh, let's let's talk about the Green Party values and platform. So the four pillars of the global green movement that um, unite all green parties are grassroots democracy, social justice, nonviolence, and ecological wisdom. Uh, so the Green Party US, um, when it formed, decided to expand that into 10 key values. And so these are the, the values that unite all green parties and all greens in the United States um, we have grassroots democracy, social justice, and equal opportunity, ecological wisdom, nonviolence. Um, then to those four pillars, we added decentralization, community-based economics, feminism and gender equity, respect for diversity, personal and global responsibility, and future focus and sustainability. And then there are some, you know, very basic uh positions of the green party uh, greens consistently have pushed for progress years ahead of the political mainstream um and in a minute i'll talk about some of the issues where greens have been uh, you know years if not decades ahead of uh you know the political mainstream um all greens pledge not to accept any corporate campaign money um and that goes for candidates as well as parties uh, Greens are active in social movements as well as electoral politics. And Greens are politically independent from the two establishment parties. Uh, so, you know, in short, we believe the two party system is the problem, not the solution. And that real democracy means multi party democracy. Um, and yeah, let's talk about how we get there. So, um, I'm sorry, it's the slideshow is taking a little bit of while, a little bit of time to respond. Um, All right, so some of the the Green Party platform is nice and long. Um, it, in fact, it might be around 80 pages. Um, there's a lot in there, but here are some of the major issues and some of those issues where Greens have really led the conversation. Uh, so single payer healthcare or Medicare for all, uh, living wages, uh, free higher education, uh, the Green New Deal, a you know, huge investment in green jobs to fight climate change, uh, ending wars, cutting military spending to reinvest in domestic needs, uh, renewable energy, public transit, conservation, biodiversity and animal rights, criminal justice reform, uh, civil liberties and ending the drug wars, uh, campaign finance reform, ranked choice voting and proportional representation, which are the solutions to some of those electoral problems that I talked about before. Um, a welcoming path to citizenship for immigrants, uh, internationalist cooperation uh, with other countries and uh, you know international institutions. And there's much, much more. Uh, you can find more at um, the Green Party website under platform. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the Green Party structure. So the National Green Party, the Green Party of the United States is a federation of state green parties that was inaugurated in 2001 with state parties as a unit of organization. Uh, so Green Party US is a national committee with voting delegates that represent accredited state parties like the Wisconsin Green Party, as well as caucuses uh, that uh, include the Women's Caucus, Black Caucus, Latinx, Lavender Caucus, which represents the LGBTQIA plus community and the Youth Caucus, um, national committee members elect a smaller steering committee to handle day-to-day -day party business. And the Green Party US is funded by donations and it has a small staff. Then uh, state Green Parties have a significant amount of autonomy 
due to the green principles of grassroots democracy and decentralization. Um, so the Wisconsin Green Party and many other state green parties have actually been around uh, for longer than the Green Party US. Um, and the, uh, in the Wisconsin Green Party, this, our state membership meetings like today are considered the highest decision-making body uh, followed by the elected coordinating council. Um, and we still, uh, you know, we put important uh, decisions to a vote for uh, by our membership. Uh, so bylaws set the basic rules for the party and can be amended by members. And the coordinating council can set policies and procedures within the basic framework laid out in the bylaws. I should mention the coordinating council is elected uh, every year at the fall gathering. So in recent years, the Wisconsin Green Party voted to become a dues-based membership organization. Uh, so that means paying annual dues as a condition of membership. And dues-paying members in good standing are entitled to participate in decision-making, to vote, and uh, run for positions in the party. And our decisions are made via modified consensus. Uh, so basically, that means if there are no unresolved concerns to a proposal, it passes with consensus. Otherwise, we require a 60% vote uh, for proposals to pass. And you can find more info at uh, wisconsingreenparty.org slash bylaws. And our bylaws are actually um, not that long or complicated. Uh, so it doesn't take that long to read them and uh, you know, understand sort of the basic ground rules that we operate with. Um, Okay, um, so sorry, the, the coordinating council includes officers, the two co-chairs who convene and facilitate meetings and serve as spokespeople, the two secretaries who record meeting notes and correspond with members, and two treasurers who manage finances, collect dues, pay expenses. Um, there's more to it, but that's the very short version the coordinating council representatives are also elected from each congressional district and accredited chapter, as well as at large. Uh, and the coordinating council meets monthly to conduct party business at meetings that are open to observation by general members. We also have committees. So committees are composed of officers and members who submit statements of interest and are approved by the coordinating council. Committees have significant autonomy, but the coordinating council has authority over them. And our committees include communications, elections, dispute resolution, finance, information technology, membership outreach, and platform and policy. Um, you can find more information at wisconsingreenparty.org slash committees. And again, this is where a lot of the work gets done. So uh, please consider joining one of our committees, you know, uh, check out this page to see what they do and, you know, where you might and interest and um, you know a statement of interest and then we have our locals so local parties are the basic building block of the green party and locals are composed of wisconsin green party members within a set geographical area uh, they can represent a city county congressional district or other set geographical area and a local can be formed by applying to the coordinating council for affiliation with at least three uh, Wisconsin Green Party members in good standing, uh, regular public meetings, and a summary of the group's proposed activities, projects, and goals. So it doesn't take a whole lot to start your own local. Um, locals can endorse local candidates, participate in local government, work with social movements, build coalitions, and do a lot more. All right, so let's talk about how you can get involved. Um, so here are some ways, become a dues paying member of the Wisconsin Green Party uh, to help support and sustain our work. Come to the Wisconsin Green Party spring and fall gatherings or participate. Uh, participate in a local chapter in your area um, or ask Wisconsin Green Party officers about organizing a local chapter in your area or congressional district. 
um, nominate yourself for Wisconsin Green Party Committee, which is where the work gets done. Uh, help the Green Party build coalitions with other groups you're involved with. Uh, contribute to the National Green Party and uh, apply to join Green Party US committees. And you can get involved with elections. You know, have you ever thought about running for office? Then get in touch with us. Or maybe you'd like to support a campaign as a team member or volunteer. Uh, we hold annual campaign schools to train potential candidates and campaign team members. And the Green Party US Coordinated Campaign Committee has more resources to help train potential candidates and campaign team members. So if you have any questions or want to get involved, then contact us. Uh, you can find contact on our website or info at wisconsingreenparty.org. And finally, I want to leave you with a quote from Rosa Clemente, the Green Party is no longer the alternative, the Green Party is the imperative. Oh, one more quote from the Green Party platform. We are the ones we've been waiting for. All right, thank you. I, I hope that this uh, Green Party 101 presentation has been helpful. I hope that people learned something. Um, and I saw that Howie Hawkins joined us, so I'm uh, happy to pass it over to Howie soon, but I did want to give people a quick chance to ask if they had any questions. Hey, Dave, was that last picture the Pinocchio Hills or where was that? It was very pretty. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, that is actually a, uh, a picture of Devil's Lake that I found um, on uh, Creative Commons. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture. Good right. job. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, again, hope people enjoyed it. And I see, you know, question, could we put it up on the website? And yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to um, just put that down in the notes so that I remember to do it. And all right, then. Great. So um, why don't we let uh, anyone who wants to take a, you know, quick one minute bio break and, you know, then we can, um, hand it over to Howie. Um, yes, I, um, I have no proprietary ownership over this information. So uh, people can feel free to share it and, you know, put it up on Green Party websites. You know, any anywhere it can be helpful, please do share it. All right, so, um, well, time really flies when you're having fun. Um, so it is uh, definitely a pleasure to be joined again by Howie Hawkins. Um, you know, I would assume Howie probably needs no introduction, but just in case anyone's not familiar with him, uh, Howie is a co-founder of the Green Party of the United States. I think Howie was there in 1984 in St. Paul. Um, when those committees of correspondence were formed uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, Howie is a lifelong activist, um, a union member. Uh, he was the first uh, candidate in the U.S. to run on the Green New Deal uh, when he ran for governor of New York in 2010. Um, and he was the, the Green Party U.S. presidential nominee in 2020, um, and he has not slowed down, has kept building the movement, um, has a weekly podcast that, uh, or sometimes more than weekly, 
which really is a must listen. I mean, I've learned so much from listening to Howie's podcast. Um, uh, along with Angela Walker, our, our uh, you know, favorite um, daughter of Milwaukee, who uh, was Howie's running mate. And Angela wasn't able to join us today, but uh, it's great to have Howie here. So without further ado, uh, let me hand it over to you, Howie. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, how long would you like me to go? You want to do question and answers or just have me talk for 50 minutes? Because I could do that. But uh, how do you want to do it? Uh, I'm sure that people have questions for you. So, um, but I would say, you know, why don't you just start um, and, you know, go as long as you want. And then uh, whenever you feel like it, uh, open it up for questions. Okay, I aim for 20 minutes. So we'll have half an hour for question and answers. Okay. Um, so I have, a, I've jotted down a number of points to make. I may not get through them all, but let's start with the political situation and the Green Party. You know, coming out of this presidential election, we got a little over 400,000 votes, which is pretty typical for independent left presidential campaigns. It's about, you know, median result for Green Party campaigns that we've run since 1996, which is not bad considering it was Trump and anybody but Trump was the dominant sentiment. But you can go back 180 years, 46 presidential campaigns where the independent left in most of those campaigns has run a ticket going back to the Liberty Party in 1840. And only five times in all those campaigns has the independent left got over 4% of the vote. And most of those were in the 19th century. The last one was nearly a century ago when Robert LaFollette got 17%. And this year it was particularly tough for us. We were totally blanked out by the corporate media and also the so-called independent progressive media. Um, but, you know, here we are, we had 400,000 votes. We're still the only national independent progressive party. So that's something to build upon. Um, I think going forward, we need to really fight for ranked choice voting and proportional representation, given that we're almost two centuries in which the independent left has been marginalized. And I would argue also the progressive left in the Democratic Party is marginalized by plurality voting, which motivates people to vote for the centrist Democrats to stop the far right Republicans and not vote for the progressive Greens. But that gives the progressives in the Democratic Party no exit, no leverage. So you have situations like the progressives in the Democratic Party getting a lot of publicity, a lot of media, but how much power do they really have? I think a good way to illustrate that is to consider that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has always wanted to be on energy and commerce. And a seat opened up on that committee after the 2020 election. And so she said, I, I want that seat. And the Democratic corporate leadership uh, got Kathleen Rice to run against her. She's a conservative Democrat from Long Island. And when the vote was taken by the policy and steering committee, the leadership body of the House caucus, the vote was 46 to 13, Kathleen Rice over AOC. AOC wanted to be on that committee because it deals with issues like Medicare for all and Green New Deal. But the corporate leadership said, nope, we're not put, we're gonna let you be there. So I think that's just to say that when we argue for ranked choice voting, and particularly for multi-seat ranked choice voting, where you get proportional representation in legislative bodies, we can win the support of progressives inside the Democratic Party. You know, in DSA, they have this debate, you know, dirty break, clean break, or no break. I don't care what kind of break they want. They need ranked choice voting. So there's a Green Party on the left that puts some pressure on the corporate Democrats to make some concessions. Um, I, that's the thing, the strongest thing I've come out of this campaign. And the ranked choice voting movement has got more momentum now than it's ever had. 
We now have 36 cities and two states with it. We got five new cities in November, Burlington, Vermont on town meeting day in March, and we got the state of Alaska in that election. Uh, there are now campaigns in 45 of the states for ranked choice voting supported by a national group called Ranked to Vote. So there's some staff support for these efforts. And I'm very involved in that. And I can tell you, you know, I've been talking about this for decades, but I've never seen a movement like this. So I think this is something we can win even in Biden time where the kind of program we've been talking about is very unlikely to be implemented. Another thing I came away from the campaign with was how far to the right our public intellectuals on the left, progressives and socialists, have moved. And this has been going on since the 1930s. You know, the communists put forward the popular front. Everybody went into the Democratic Party with Roosevelt. Uh, but what happened was the left as an alternative with its own identity and banner in a, in a program for system change from capitalism to democratic socialism disappeared because the lefties were all working for liberals in the Democratic Party at best. And we had another wave of that coming out of the new left of the 1960s. I mean, I was part of that in the ultra lefts, you know, the Weathermen and the Maoists, the Black Panther Party, Tom Hayden. By 1973, 74, they all went into the Democratic Party. The old Socialist Party had their realignment strategy. They went into the Democratic Party as the DSA, New American Movement, which is kind of a post-SDS group, uh, wasn't so ultra left, but they ended up in DSA. And so the independent left has been small and it's you know to the Greens credit that we have kept this up for a few decades when most of the left is going into the Democratic Party and disappeared as an alternative. They went in with the Rainbow Coalition, uh, they went in with Bernie Sanders, uh, and, you know, we've stayed out here to give an alternative. And I think, you know, that is uh, to our credit. And it also shows that we're needed because our ranks are always replenished by really pissed off former Democrats because they find out the Democrats are on the other side of the barricades. You know, whether it's the war in Iraq, the fight over fracking, getting affordable housing, because most Democratic machines are funded by the real estate industry. So, uh, what happened though in, in this campaign was our, our leftist intellectuals went from what they did in 2004 when they said the Greens sh should do safe states, you know, vote for Kerry in the battleground states and then vote for Cobb in the safe states. This time they had a no state strategy. Vote for Biden everywhere and don't vote for the Greens. And you know, they've rationalized their support for the Democrats uh, by, you know, saying we got to stop the far right. But I think what the left intellectuals have done is they've given up on what they profess to believe in. They think the best way to fight the far right is with this Democratic Party neoliberalism and, you know, militaristic imperialism abroad. That's the only thing that can defeat the right, rather than a program of radically democratic and ecological socialism, which we talk about. And so I guess, you know, my message to us is, there's an old saying came out of the civil rights movement, we are the leaders we've been looking for. I think we need to recognize that we are the public intellectuals we've been looking for. And instead of looking for validation from the Noam Chomsky's to the Cornell West, who are not gonna give it to us, we need to start putting our own people out there put in our own publications, our own op-eds, doing our own media work, because this academic base uh, left is, you know, they, they, they've lost themselves in the Democratic Party. So I would also say that, you know, this lesser evil dynamic has got worse. And it's not just Trump. It's really over the last decade, the, Republicans have become an extremist party, not just a conservative party. And their strategy is rule or ruin, which gives progressives all the more incentive to vote defensively for the Democrats instead of for an alternative. And that just makes it more difficult for us. It's always been difficult. So that brings me back to 
working for ranked choice voting. And particularly, I want to come back to this point. When it comes to legislative bodies, we should not settle for single member district ranked choice voting. Because that's still a winner take all system. In the end, whoever wins in the rounds gets all the representation in that district. And in most districts today, that's going to be Democrats or Republicans. So we may get a bigger vote in the first round, but in the end, we get nothing. And a good illustration of that is what happened to the Australian Greens in 2019. Their House of Representatives is 151 seats, single member districts using ranked choice voting. Nationwide, the Greens got 10.4% of the first round votes. They only got one of the 151 seats. On the other hand, the Australian Senate is elected by multi-seat ranked choice voting from several districts. And the way that's worked out is they got uh, also a little over 10% of the vote. They have 12% of the seats. So you can see the difference. If it's single member districts, in the end, it doesn't matter whether it's plurality voting or ranked choice voting, it's still gonna be winner take all favoring the two parties. So if you get involved in this ranked choice voting movement, uh, don't let them settle for single member district only. That's suitable for executive offices where there's only one seat up, but not for legislative bodies. We need a system where every party gets its fair and proportional share of representation. So another point that's coming up more and more now is that maybe Biden's different. He's not the same old uh, neoliberal practicing austerity. And I would caution us to not get carried away. Remember his COVID relief package, which everybody's kind of excited about, was only, is only half the size of what we got under the Trump administration a year ago. And now he's put forward his infrastructure proposal. It's fiscal conservatism. It's pay as you go. He decided how much he's gonna spend based on how much he thought he could raise from his reform of the corporate tax. Rather than, he did it backwards. What you need to do is, what do we need to do to address our infrastructure shortcomings and the climate emergency? And then, you know, whatever it costs, you may have to borrow for it in order to get the investments now before it's too late. But it's not, that's not his approach. It's still that old balanced budget conservatism, which makes no sense at the federal level where the government can issue currency, bar, you know, spend the money and then pay for it over time through taxes. And I would argue in an eco-socialist Green New Deal, public provision of power, transportation, housing, the green machinery that has zero emissions and uh, zero waste as we got to move toward that. Um, and that brings in revenues in the form of uh, fees for the power, rents for public housing, fares for transportation, and uh, sales or leases of that green machinery. So it's still the old pay-go conservatism that the Democratic leadership buys as much as the Republicans. And I would also caution that Biden is pretty gutless. We saw two instances of that this week. He had promised to raise the refugee cap from Trump's paltry 15,000 to 125,000. And then he said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to wait a year before I raise the refugee cap. And then he got a lot of pushback and he says, well, I'm going to give you another number in May. So he is movable. But the other thing he did was, uh, and this has been going on, he said he would get an emergency OSHA standard to deal with the COVID pandemic so that Workers, essential workers had the proper protective equipment and practices at work, such as social distancing. And OSHA hasn't issued those. And, you know, the stories in the media are that they're afraid of the backlash from the Trump people that don't want to wear masks. And I would say that's gutless. And we got to push back on that. And then, of course, we got his foreign policy, which is the same old bipartisan imperialism. They still support this guy Guaido, you know, just a backbencher before in the Venezuelan uh, assembly. Uh, they're back in the dictator of, Hit of Haiti, who won't leave after his term is up. 
uh, they are spinning, continuing to spend on nuclear modernization, including the ICBMs that we don't really need for deterrence and the saber rattling toward Russia and China. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's only the U.S. fault. I was pretty disgusted when uh, Stepanopoulos asked Biden if uh, he thought Putin was a killer. Instead of sidestepping that question, Biden said yes. And then Putin gets out there and does this social media stuff and says, I want to have an online meeting with Biden. He was posturing. They're posturing for the public instead of having a serious meeting to talk about the nuclear arms race, which is accelerating, and climate, and other important issues. So uh, nothing much has changed there. They're the same old Democrats. And as I mentioned before, I think we should not be taken in by the publicity that the Sanders and the AOCs are getting. Because in the end, they really don't have that much leverage in the Democratic Party. And so I got six minutes left. I, let me say a few words about the climate emergency. It is definitely an emergency. I mean, if 350 parts per million that James Hansen proposed 13 years ago is the safe limit. And even in that article, it was a peer reviewed article. It, you know, they said that, well, actually to get, uh, the, to stop Arctic ice melting, we maybe need to get down to 300 or 325 parts per million. And there were other climate scientists at the time saying, no, we got to get right back to the pre-industrial level of 280 parts per million. In any case, there was sale past 350 in 1988. We averaged 418 in March. We hit a record 421 on April 3rd. The last time carbon uh, in the atmosphere was this high was in the middle of the Pliocene uh, when the temperature was 11 degrees Fahrenheit height higher than now and the oceans were 130 feet higher. That's what bakes, is baked into the climate system now. If we don't not only stop emissions, but start drawing emissions out of the atmosphere by rebuilding soils, which are carbon rich and reforesting all the areas that have been cut down around the world, which will bring carbon out of the atmosphere and back into the biosphere. So, we are definitely in an emergency. Another way of looking at it is when the 1.5 degree Celsius uh, report came from the International Panel on Climate Change, they said we had 420 gigatons carbon left to emit before we would uh, basically have a uh, two thirds chance. At 1.5 degrees or at 420 gigatons, we'd have a two thirds chance of keeping the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And I don't like those odds. It's like putting two bullets in the chamber of a six, uh, six chamber revolver and pulling the trigger. But that's the odds we've got. But we are killing that budget. We're down to 280 gigatons left. And at the rate we're burning carbon, we're gonna blow through that budget in 2027. It's just, you know, a blink in geological time and even in the industrial era's time. So, <clears throat> of course, we put out an Eco Socialist Green New Deal, $27.5 trillion over 10 years to zero out emissions, set up the uh, processes to start going toward negative emissions. Um, and here we got Biden putting 2.3 trillion in the infrastructure, and only about a third of it is directly related to climate. And it's not effective. They say nothing about stopping fracking and these pipelines and new fossil fuel infrastructure. There's a lot of talk about carbon capture and storage, which is the trick when they say net zero, they're going to keep burning carbon or fossil fuels and then say they're going to capture it, which isn't going to happen because CO2 is basically worthless. And what company is going to add C uh, carbon capture unless it's totally subsidized by the government? And to actually put it into geological formations, you gotta have a whole infrastructure of piping to get it to those formations. And that doesn't bring in any revenue. So I think that's a pipe dream. They promote waste incinerators as a so-called alternative energy. Their clean energy standard includes all those things and nuclear power, which the Wall Street people like Lazard, you know, the big asset manager 
has been keeping track and they say nuclear power costs two to three times more than most forms of solar or wind over their life cycles. So, you know, the Biden plan is not a plan to deal with the climate. You know, maybe in 1992 when we came out of uh, Kyoto, it would have been an acceptable first step, but it's totally inadequate at this point. So, you know, the argument for an eco-socialist Green New Deal is we're in an emergency like we were in World War II. And what our federal government did then was take over a quarter of industry, you know, Ford factories, GM factories, and so forth, in order to turn industry on a dime into what they called the arsenal of democracy, to arm the allies to defeat Hitler and Mussolini and Tojo. We need to do nothing less through the public sector because it's going to take public enterprise and planning to get this all done on a rapid timeline. Biden's plan is all tax credits. And that's just kind of leisurely letting the market take its course without any real uh, good idea of how long it's going to take. And I can go into a lot more deal. I'm writing, I got 6,000 words right now on the Biden plan and what's wrong with it, but I won't go on all the details. But the last point I'll make is that uh, there's still things we can do just on climate. Uh, we're winning fights against fracking and pipelines. The Delaware Basin River Commission just banned fracking. We got Keystone XL stopped. The Dakota Access Pipeline and Enbridge Line 3 are the most prominent ones, although there are pipelines all across the country that people are fighting. But the Dakota Access and, and Line 3, Biden could stop by executive order. And I think he's pushable on things like this. So I think we can speak up. Uh, we need to push for just transitions when we do this. When XL, Keystone XL closed down, I'm a former Teamster, and I heard it from my Teamster buddies. Hey, those are all Teamsters. They lost their job. And everybody from Trump to Trumpka, the AFL-CIO, was making that point. And that's the old corporate line that you can't do these environmental things because it costs jobs, which is a big lie. There are a lot more jobs in renewables than fossil fuels and nuclear. Um, so a just transition needs to be attached to all these uh, demands we make to stop the new fossil fuel infrastructure. I think we can just keep demanding more. There's gonna be a big fight over what this infrastructure plan ends up being between now and the summer. Uh, you know, Sunrise Movement and a whole group of uh, big nonprofits have a thing they call the Thrive Agenda, which is $10 trillion over 10 years. That's not as much as I think we need, but I was out there with Sunrise a couple of weeks ago, demanding more than what Biden's offering. I think we can do that and just keep the pressure on. And then I think in our communities, we should be pushing for local Green New Deals. Does your city or town or county have a climate uh, carbon reduction plan? If not, that's something we should bring in in our election campaigns and our movement work. And it should include everything we want. And because we can't fund it all through you know, local government, given the balanced budget requirements and the limitations on the kind of taxes you can raise at the municipal level, uh, we can do what we can do and then use that plan to go to our members of Congress and say, we need federal funding to get this done. And then of course, you know, keep pushing for a full scale Green New Deal at the federal level. And I think, you know, while things look kind of dismal, we're in this emergency, Biden doesn't really have a response. The public is with us. They know we got a climate problem. Maybe they don't realize how fast and uh, how fast it's coming on and how much we need to do. But I think we can mobilize people behind it. It's a very popular issue. And then the last thing is, for me, I think the number one thing we need to do is try to change the terrain of electoral politics through ranked choice voting and multi seat ranked choice voting in legislative bodies. If we get that, I think Greens are going to, we're going to do better than the Australian Greens. I mean, we get 10%, 20%, 30%. I got 48% in one council race running as a Green. I think we got more Green-minded people in this country than even in Europe, where there's some other sort of, you know, there's a Labor Party tradition or Social Democratic Party tradition. So I think there's a lot of room for us. But in this plurality voting system, particularly with an extremist Republican Party now, uh, we got a real tough uh, situation, but if we can change the electoral system, I think 
we can make progress fast. So I went three minutes over, but there's still about half an hour to do questions and answers. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Howie. Um, all right, yeah, and I, I don't think anyone minds you taking a, a few extra minutes. Uh, it's really interesting stuff. And yeah, I mentioned, you know, Howie and Angela's podcast is great. There's a question about that. So that's at greensocialist.net slash pod. Or you can just go to YouTube and, you know, search for the Howie Hawkins YouTube channel. Um, so let's see. I saw a question from Tom um, about uh, HR1 saying, would you review your work on HR1 Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition uh, with Harvey Wasserman, Emily Levy, et cetera. Um, and then I see some folks are getting on the stack with other questions, but why don't, why don't we start there? Yeah, well, like many Greens, and this, we became aware of this last year when HR1 passed the House, uh, the matching funds qualification for presidential primary is increased fivefold from raising $5,000 in small contributions from 20 states to $25,000 in 20 states. And uh, Richard Winger of Ballot Access News in February posted uh, you know, what the third party candidates have raised since this matching funds program was set up uh, with the Federal Election Campaign Act, the FICA in 1974. And probably none of us would have qualified under the new standard. Uh, so that's our objection to what's in HR1. Uh, HR1 doesn't really deal with big donors. In fact, it opens the doors for more. For example, party committees, of which both major parties have three, that can contribute now $100 million to a presidential candidate rather than the current limit of $5,000. And what you can donate to those committees is not the limit you can do contribute to individuals, which was 5,800 last year, primary and general combined, uh, it's like 29,000 for each. So you can give over $100,000. And then of course, there's the unlimited contributions that are going into independent expenditures. One good thing in HR1 is it does require disclosure of dark money above a certain threshold. That's good, but it, it doesn't deal with independent expenditures, which would require a constitutional amendment. One of the things I found out in this research is old Joe Biden had in his campaign platform, he wanted a constitutional amendment that would enable the government to ban private contributions and have every federal candidate publicly funded, fully publicly funded. I mean, he was better than Bernie on that one. And, uh, and then he said, well, if we can't get that, we'll go with the matching funds HR1 proposals. So anyway, we've had that objection. The problem we face with HR1 is the Republicans are out there in almost every state with scores of bills. It's, forget the number now, the Brennan Center's been keeping track, hundreds of bills to make it harder for people to vote. And that's aimed at likely Democratic voters, Black people, Latinos, Asian Americans, young people. Uh, and, you know, we got to stop that. It's really important. The other thing it does is end partisan gerrymandering with which the Republicans, because they control 30 state legislatures in the country, both houses, used to draw the lines so they overrepresent themselves. And I forget the numbers in Wisconsin, you know this. You know, the, the Republicans are way overrepresented in the number of seats they have in their legislature compared to the number of votes they got statewide. And that's how the Republicans, a minority party, are grossly overrepresented in our political system. The U.S. Senate adds to that, the Electoral College adds to that, but this gerrymandering, that's one thing H.R. 1 does deal with. So anyway, those are some of the issues around H.R. 1. And uh, so some of us have been writing op-eds and contacting members of Congress. Um, there's a lot of people talking about this lobbying. I don't know how much traction we've got. We got a little attention, you know, uh, Lawrence Lessig at uh, Harvard, law professor, decided he would uh, respond to a 600 word op-ed I wrote. I actually wrote about 6,000 words on it in counterpunch, but uh, that would have answered more of his questions. But anyway, so there's a little debate going on there. Um, 
the big question is, and this is where we got to see if Biden has any guts. If they don't get rid of the filibuster, no chance this is going to pass. And they still have to win over Mansion and Cinema. So those are some of the issues around HR1. Yeah, thanks, Howie. And I also wanted to mention um, how we actually had a great interview with Ryan Grimm um, on the Young Turks, and you can find that on YouTube too. I'll try and find the link. Um, but that was a really good discussion on HR1, and that um, was encouraging because it was an example of a reporter who at first was really hostile to the green position and then, you know, seemed to come around in a in a pretty big way uh at least judging by that conversation yeah we tweeted at him pretty harshly and <laughs> he, he, he got a hold of me and uh, he he is symptomatic of the fact that i'm getting more media now than i did when i was a candidate and uh i i told him before we actually went live that you know i'm like that tree that falls in the forest uh did it make any noise if nobody heard it that's kind of like our presidential campaign. And he said, no, nah, we knew you were running. You were running. So maybe we'll get more coverage going forward because I think he recognized that, you know, we're raising a real issue with, uh, you know, access to public campaign financing. Right on. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention, because you brought up gerrymandering and that is something that comes up constantly in Wisconsin. Um, because, you know, the state has been horribly gerrymandered since 2010. And, um, you know, that's one of the top things that Democrats think about. And, you know, it's a huge obstacle to democracy here. And, um, you know, so when we talk about electoral reform, people often say, well, the first thing we got to deal with is this gerrymandering. And, you know, I say, well, yeah, Greens are absolutely against gerrymandering. The thing is that with single member districts, you're never going to get rid of gerrymandering. You can only manage it, you know, and it's all and you're always going to have the problem of, you know, you're, you're going to have those same problems. You can maybe reduce them a little bit. But, um, you know, the basic issue of people not getting the representation they voted for is going to remain. The only way to actually get rid of gerrymandering is proportional representation. Um, and I think that that's a way to, you know, find common ground, but also to like really get proportional representation more into the conversation. Um, so, uh, I see that Bill is, is on the stack and then Greg, and then another question from Tom. Uh, so go ahead, Bill. A question and then a comment. They're not related. Um, the question is, um, shortly after the election, you and Angela um, launched the Green Socialist Organizing Project, and I, I attended the first couple of meetings, but then was unable to keep it up because of some conflicting um, commitments. But I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about that and the objectives of it. And then the comment had to do with uh, ranked choice voting. Uh, at the end of last summer, my sister-in-law, who is kind of a moderate liberal, gave my wife and I this book and said we had to read it. And it's by Catherine Gell. She's from Wisconsin. It's called The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. So I said, oh, okay, I'll read it. And uh, I read it. And uh, my wife and I both agreed that uh, the, the, it was almost entirely supportable in terms of a series of um, democratic um, reforms put forward in a way that tried to make them um, attractive to both Republicans and Democrats related to um, ranked choice voting and proportional representation and so on. It's a lot more elaborate than that. And I noticed that this... Uh, uh, initiative has gotten a hearing in, in Wisconsin. Uh, th there's supporters uh, both from the Republicans and the Democrats that support at least some of these reforms that they're putting forward related to ranked choice voting and, and, and other methods. 
And I wonder if you were, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about what's on the ground right now in these 45 um, state initiatives that you referred to, past. Okay, well, the Green Socialist Organizing Project is, we're using that to continue to advance the platform that we advanced during the campaign in three ways. One is political education. So the podcasts are part of that. Uh, we're coming out with an online publication called Green Socialist Notes, which will be kind of a rolling blog for a while, but the goal is to get it to the point where we can uh, lay out uh, issues that people can download, reprint, and put on tables or hand out to their locals. Uh, so that's education. Uh, we have an issues group that uh, part of it was if there was energy among the people involved, uh, see if we could work together on issues. At this point, they're uh, drafting position papers, one on ranked choice voting and proportional representation, another on debt, which is uh, at this point, a lot of discussion about, you know, what do we do about debt, you know, and how do you relieve debt and who pays? Uh, so that's in the works. And then we have another group that's working on party building and that's really where we can to help locals really organize, you know, mass-based locals that are there for the long haul and have a strategy, not just for running candidates here and there, but taking power in their city or county or town, uh, and also helping some of the state parties. Uh, the Green Party, you know, to be honest, has, you know, maybe a dozen real state parties. I think Wisconsin would be in that category. And a lot of others that are just a small handful of people that sort of have the franchise, but they're not organizing. And, uh, you know, as we went around campaigning, uh, we had to sort of tell them that, you know, you need to run a primary, elect your delegates. Um, you can't just, the handful of you do it, you got to reach out to, if you have party enrollment in your state to those people, if you have some kind of broader network of people involved, you got to include them. So they're, they're in a weak state organization. So those are the three things. Uh, if you go to greensocialist.net, uh, we have a statement of basically purposes and principles. What we believe, there are five points there, and what we do, uh, five points there, the last being you know, helping to build the Green Party uh, because it is the only national alternative that's independent and progressive in the country. So, and if you wanna get involved, sign up there. And uh, it's having meetings, man, more than I can attend or want to attend, but I am. Uh, it's pretty, you know, the activity is going forward. Um, yeah, the state of the ranked choice voting movement uh, and how, you know, multipartisan is it? Uh, I think it varies state by state. Some states have been at it longer. Uh, one of the arguments that you can make to some Republicans is that they're in you know, a Republican in Madison or Milwaukee isn't getting no representation. With proportional representation, they might get some. So you can win people, you know, who are on the right with that argument. Of course, libertarians like it, uh, and the Greens like it. And then progressive Democrats, as I said earlier, I think we have a good argument to make to them is even if they don't want to break from the Democratic Party, it helps them to have an independent force outside that gives them leverage inside. And that's what uh, ranked choice voting, particularly multi-seat ranked choice voting will give them uh, because then we're a real threat and uh, that gives them leverage, you know, like if it's Medicare for all, you know, we're pushing from the outside, they're pushing from the inside. Pelosi doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, Obama wouldn't let John Conyers even testify about it. But if we had this stronger independent force, uh, that might change. So, um, so the state of the movement varies state by state. And uh, the general approach is, let's build a real movement in our state before we go, you know, have legislatures, legislators start drawing up legislation. Because we don't want to just get the, you know, the left fringe or the libertarian fringe to put in a bill that gets, you know, just goes to committee and dies. We want the legislators to feel like they better respond 
because there's a lot of people in organizations out here. So, you know, the strategy is to build individual support, organizational endorsements, do a lot of public education so people understand what it is. And then when we're ready, go to the state legislatures or in a city or town or county, you know, go to the local government and, uh, you know, and win. All right, cool. And yeah, I, I just want to mention quickly that um, I was talking with someone from Rank the, the Rank the Vote Coalition in Wisconsin, and they're going to send us some information um, about how folks who are interested can in get involved in the movement because uh, they're ramping up their um, you know volunteer efforts. Um, all right, so I, it looks like uh, Greg is on stack and Tom and Marsha uh, have put some questions in. So why don't we go to Greg next? Hi, Holly, thanks for coming. I um, just wanted to ask you if you, how you feel about the Postmaster General situation and you know, if you think um, that Biden is really gonna do something about that, it seems like he's really dragging his feet on that and that is, you know, quite a voter access kind of issue with him destroying the postal service. And then my second part, or my second question is, some people have brought up in our local meeting that the John Lewis Voting Rights Act might be an alternative to HR1. Do you think that's a more viable thing as far as getting past the Senate? Um, so those are my two questions. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here, thanks. Um, yeah, we call it the joy, no joy when I go to the post office and talk to the clerks and the mail handlers and the uh, letter carriers. Um, it's more than just the mail being slow. They're overstaffed, uh, their equipment. I mean, in our regional hub where I worked a couple of uh, peak seasons ago, uh, after I retired from the Teamsters, I, I decided I need to make a little money uh, they're sorting machines. They had five, they, they scrapped three of them, two of which have already been recycled. One is in storage and they are backed up. I mean, the mail has really slowed down around here. So we call them postmaster no joy. Um, and you're right. I mean, Biden, uh, he could put a whole new board in there. The democratic members of that board are going along with the joy. Uh, they just came out with their 10 year plan. And uh, well, I've been doing the climate stuff. Actually, they do have a plan to electrify their whole uh, fleet of uh, vehicles, which is like 120,000 or some number like that by 2035, which is a good plan, but they need $8 billion from Congress. And that's where, uh, you know, Biden could, he didn't put it in his infrastructure plan. He did say they wanted to electrify the postal service, but he didn't put the money behind that statement. Although I have to say, it's hard to tell. If you read the fact sheet, 12,000 words, it came out when Biden un un unveiled his infrastructure plan. Man, a lot of those statements are vague. It's really hard to you know, decipher what money they're spending goes where. Investopedia has the best budget I've seen, um, but even that is uh, still pretty general. So the Postal Service, there, there's legislation that uh, people like AOC and Sanders have put in uh, to move this along. That's good legislation. They want to bring back the Postal Bank, which was my first bank. I mean, I was radicalized by civil rights, Vietnam, and Johnson closing down my bank. Because when I was a teenager, that's where I put my money. Every time I got $5, I got this little bond or certificate. And I had to cash that in and go to commercial banks which really wasn't interested in my little bit of money. So, uh, but that we need for unbanked people. So they're not getting ripped off by these payday loan operations and so forth and these cash checking operations. Um, and that's a great issue. I mean, the postal service is very popular, you know, among the people. And, you know, anytime they try to close down a local post office, man, the whole town from Trumpies to socialists, are all against it. So I think that's an issue that uh, 
has a lot of support and we should work on. The John Lewis Voting Rights Act is different. It is about restoring the preclearance provision that the Supreme Court took out of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And the preclearance provision means if you're a jurisdiction that has a history of discrimination, any election law changes you make have to be approved by the Justice Department. And they got rid of that, I think it was 20, 2013. And immediately, I mean, the same day, these right-wing Republicans in these states started putting in voter suppression laws. So it's pretty clear that we still need that preclearance provision. But it's not a substitute for the things in HR1. It covers another thing that HR1 doesn't, the preclearance provision. All right, thanks. Um, so uh, I don't think Marsha has gotten to, you know, ask a question yet. So why don't we why don't we jump to Marsha and then Tom's got a couple of questions. Um, Marsha, do you want to ask yours? Hi, Howie. Hi, everyone. So having spent many years of my life and most recently the last year as an alder was one of the more difficult years I spent. And I really saw a change in the movement for the good, but there's one part of it I just I thought I would raise to the Greens and everyone who wants to consider running for Alder or local government or whatever. The whole question of the role of white progressives in these movements for change. And, and there have been many people in, at least locally that suggest that progressive should whites should step aside for people of color and it doesn't always necessarily matter about their political orientation. And I'm just wondering what thoughts you might have on that. But I think I had another question, but that's the one I think about a lot. Well, I've been observing this for a long time. Uh, when I was in the anti-apartheid movement, uh, black students would say, oh, we got this. And then they'd shut it down. Uh, there was one of our students where I went to Dartmouth who lost an internship with a member of Congress in Texas because he was pictured at any war dem any apartheid demonstration. So you can understand why they did that, but you know the politics do matter. Uh, later, James Boggs, Jimmy Boggs in Detroit, you know, told me many times, don't fall for that because a lot of people are just looking to eliminate their competition for offices or funding. It really matters about the politics. And I think, you know, I'm a white progressive who was asked to run for the city council seat that I live in, in a you know, predominantly black district by the black democratic committee people. I wasn't planning to run for it, but because I've been involved in the movement, they said, you know, we know what you stand for. We know you do a good job. And so we ask you to run. They were upset because the district, which finally got a black representative in the 90s, uh, those black representatives were creatures of the machine. They were taking their orders from real estate, basically. So the politics do matter. And I notice a lot of this, you know, I, I think on the other hand, there is a you know culture of uh, among white progressives that doesn't hear uh, people from other ethnic groups or women or just you know oppressed groups generally, and uh, they tend to get involved in groups and and you know take over positions, talk too much, and so forth. So there's that side of it as well. But I think to just say uh, step aside so you know, people of color or women or whoever can run. Uh, I think the real question is how does the left build a, a mass movement in those communities as well as, you know, the white community? And actually we probably have a better chance than in the white community. But a lot of times people come forward, make that demand, they don't have a base except among, you know, the machine. So I know it's a touchy question sometimes and you know, people put you on the spot, but I think, you know, it really gets down to the politics. You know, if, if that black or Latino candidate has got a good program and a record of following through and working hard, sure. But just because they're black or Latino doesn't mean uh, they get a, they, they can just tell all the white progressives, get out of my way. 
Thank okay. you. And my other question was around um, the whole movement around abolition and defunding the police and what kind of on, on the kind of national level, how do you see the role of our party um, in those debates? Yeah, this came up a lot during the campaign. Angela and I were emphasizing community control. I think unless you're in the movement, you hear abolition or you hear defunding and people who do want the police to come when they call, when there's a problem, uh, they say, well, you know, what am I gonna do in that situation? I mean, it's black community I live in, the people, this is a police force that's been under a federal consent decree since 1980 to get a force that reflects the community. Uh, the community is half people of color in Syracuse. The force is over 90% white 40 years later, still. So, and they harass people. We have stop and frisk. They don't call it that, but that's what they do. So the attitude in the community is when we don't want them, they harass us. When we do need them, like to solve a murder, and we have a lot of those, they're not around. Uh, if I got a problem, I got to wait to for them to show up, if at all. So uh, I don't think defunding and abolition are popular demands. Community control is. And I think under that rubric, then you can say, if the community had control, would we send cops in to charge the homeless with vacancy? Or would we try to get a program to provide them with a home? And addicts with a drug treatment instead of a drug charge. And people with a mental episode with the kind of care they needed rather than a cop with a gun who's clueless as to how to deal with this person. A lot of the people that get killed are people having mental health issues. So I, I come back to community control of the police so that then we can decide, you know, how to redirect budgets to the extent we want to and how to get the police to be responsive to us. I, I came up with that in, you know, the Bay Area, California, where I grew up in the Panther Party, put that on a referendum in Berkeley in 1971. And, uh, you know, Bobby Seale used to say, uh, the, 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 the poster said, pigs or policemen. In other words, we're going to keep the cops that abuse us or we're going to have people that serve us. So that's kind of the way I've handled that issue. And uh, I haven't, you know, used defunding and abolition as, as slogans, you know, to mobilize people around. I've mobilized around community control. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so Tom, uh, you had some questions. Why don't you take it away? Oh, or you you can just read those. <laughs> sure. I I feel like the the first two can kind of be. Let's try and roll the first two into one. Okay. The what do you think about the Ukraine Russia Russia Gate situation and Biden's handling, and how will the U.S. adjust? Um, with the Chinese economy surpassing ours. Oh, uh, it's got to admit at some point that China has more power because <clears throat> it's going to be so obvious. Uh, pass. Well, you know, my attitude is we got to work with these people, even if we don't like what's going on inside their countries because of the nuclear arms race which is accelerated in a climate emergency. Uh, on a nuclear arms race, the US initiated this modernization program. I mentioned the ICBMs. Also, they're putting more tactical nukes and conventional forces with the crackpot military doctrine they call quote unquote escalate to deescalate. So if you're in a conventional war, like we might have in the Ukraine and you're losing, you use tactical nukes to throw back the other side and then you say, let's de-escalate, which is absurd. The Russians have the same policy. And as Daniel Ellsberg pointed out in the Doomsday Machine, his second Pentagon Papers came out a few years ago. Once the nukes start flying, it's automated. They all fly and we're done. So uh, that's what we need to talk about. And, you know, Russiagate, I mean, that was a metaphor for saying, like Hillary Clinton, that 
the Russians won the election for Trump and that we need to saber rattle and pressure Russia militarily. I don't agree with that. I do think the Russians tried to do what they could do. That's what intelligence secret services do. If uh, their services weren't doing that, Putin would fire them. So I think that was going on, but it doesn't explain what happened. There are much bigger factors in that election, like black voter suppression and uh, Clinton not giving people a reason to vote for in those people that went from Obama to Trump, um, basically on economic issues. So there's a lot of factors that, that went in. So uh, I've been called a Russia gator. I've been called a Russian asset because I go on Sputnik and RT. And I also think, you know, the Russians did something, but it's not, doesn't explain what happened uh, in the 2016 election. As far as the Ukraine goes, you know, the Minsk Accords really ought to be upheld and we ought to push for that because then it would let Ukraine be neutral and have relations with both the West and Russia. And instead now Russia and US are getting involved in what could become a proxy war, if not a hot war. Russians have 80,000 troops on the northern border of Ukraine. They're in eastern Ukraine. They took over Crimea. And uh, Zelensky says he wants to join the EU and NATO, which is provocative to the Russians. So it's, it's a dire situation. I think our position is to push for Ukraine being neutral and having good relations with both sides. Um, and then the Chinese economy, look, to the extent the Chinese are being productive and raising uh, some of their people out of poverty, that's great. And that should not be seen as competition. I mean, we really got to get out of this, uh, you know, uh, zero sum game of capitalism where I can only win if you lose. We got to push toward cooperative economic relationships. And uh, I think the Chinese need to have that attitude too, because, you know, frankly, I think they have more billionaires than we do now. Their billionaires are in their Congress. They don't just buy it. Um, you know, there's some real issues of inequality and especially climate issues. They get a lot of credit for building uh, and producing and deploying solar panels around Beijing and cities like that. They had to because the air was killing people. But their Belts and Roads Initiatives plans to install 800 new coal fire plants to power it across the Eurasian continent into Africa. That's a problem. So we need to be talking with Russia and China, particularly on the arms race and uh, the climate emergency. That's the most important thing. Uh, we can't change those countries. I think we can speak up for human rights, but the thing is we can't condition having talks on their human rights records. Once you make those conditions, you never get to the talks. And in fact, when you pressure these countries, it reinforces the nationalist narrative they use to be repressive toward their own people. So I think we can you know, speak up on behalf of human rights and at the same time be realistic in saying, we got to talk Turkey on these issues because you know, it's a life or death issue for both of us. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Tom also raised a question about any opinions on updating Section 230 or other ways to increase media integrity? Yeah, Section 230, both Trump and the Democrats want to get rid of it. That basically says media companies are not liable for what other people say on their platforms. I think we need that for freedom of speech in the press. Now, there being private platforms, they can uh, kick people off like Twitter did Trump for you know, basically being a racist and lying about the election and, you know, having a bad impact on the community. The problem is some of these companies like Facebook, like Google, like Twitter, like Amazon have become monopolies. And monopolies, you know, that gives them too much power. So they become like a private government. And maybe it's time to talk about either antitrust, if that's appropriate, but in some cases it's not because 
people like these platforms where everybody's on them and all the information is there so everybody has access. And maybe we should talk about social ownership instead of private investor ownership in a form that keeps them independent of the state, which could be done by selecting their boards by lot and, and just leaving it out of elections and the influence that big interests can have. And you will get a random sample of the public and then they can decide on the policies. We do that with juries. And you know, I think in a more democratic society, we would do it for a number of other things. Like in a community control debate, there's an argument that we shouldn't have those boards that uh, are the police commissions elected because the police union has a big role, the real estate industry has a big role. Let's select them by lot. So those are some of my thoughts on that. The, uh, the private censorship is a problem. The monopoly is a problem. And uh, it's one of those issues that didn't get debated, except to the extent that Biden and Trump agreed that uh, Section 230 needs to be basically gutted. All right. So I'm not sure if there are any other questions. i give people one more chance in case you have any burning questions. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot, Howie. I know that you had a bunch of other commitments today and still took the time to come and join us. And it's always a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I got to say, it's continually impressed how you, uh, you have an answer to every question. <laughs> And uh, I, don't, I don't know how you do it. Um, is it uh, is it coffee or uh, or uh, tea or uh, superfoods? But <laughs> retirement, I recommend it to everybody. You have a lot more time to keep up on the news. But to get there, I mean, that's a whole nother issue. You know, I was lucky. I have a Teamsters pension, and uh, most people my age are still working if they can. And if they can't, they're, uh, they're in poverty, you know, with a social security, it's not enough. Yeah. Um, you know, I just saw something really interesting. Um, the, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk of universal basic income and, you know, different questions around that on the Lisa Savage campaign we um, decided to talk about guaranteed uh, basic or guaranteed minimum income through a negative income tax, um, which was, you know, based largely on what you were talking about, Howie. Um, and I just, I saw the Green Party of Canada came out with their policy, which they call guaranteed livable income. And I, I thought, hey, I really like that formulation uh, guaranteed livable income. So anyway, just, um, that's just thought of that after that last thing that you said, but yeah. So, th so thanks a lot for uh, joining us and, um, you know, we'll definitely stay in touch with everything that you're doing. And, um, yeah, so then I, th I think the only other thing that we have is our co-chair Joe Nathan Kingfisher, um, prepared some remarks uh, and yeah, um, after that we can adjourn and yeah, thanks everyone for, um, joining us today and for sticking around. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I had a few rare things to say for posterity. Greetings from the age of the Anthropocene, the era of human influence, our works and garbage form and enduring layer of sedimentary rock in Earth's history. Here in northern Wisconsin, nine years ago, we had a once in a 500 year storm. 500 years ago, we had a once in a thousand year storm. Three years ago, we had a once in a thousand year storm. Hold on now. What do you think we're in for soon? Well, what is different about politics in this era this year? The Earth will not continue to allow politics as has been. The planet is far different now because of humanity's action. And we are the crowd that knows this. From Wisconsin, hello, Florida. Goodbye, Florida. See you in the ocean later. 
I used to think that coastal land loss would happen like a bathtub filling up. Now I realize it is hurricane megastorms that will chomp and scrub the land away. 21 years ago, I was dismayed at Florida political corruption that threw the presidential election. Now I realize that uh, they were sealing their own fate into the rising ocean. Goodbye, Florida. Your electorate will be dispersed among us inlanders soon. There's some redistricting for you. I want to talk about the difference between affinity groups and political groups in regard to our Green Party. The phrase green society is describing something existent in the world. That is our existing affinity versus creating something new in the world. That would be American green government, ecoarchy, a government for and by the sustainable people who respect an enduring natural world. How will the sustainable few survive the unsustainable many? Now for some scathing review sound bites. Let's talk about group loyalty and sports team mentality. Mentality, sports team mentality. Policy change versus political party change. Repubs have become far right fascists. Dems have utilized progressive messages, yet corporate influence stops real progressive change. The Dems now know how dangerous the repubs are. 35% of Wisconsinites voted repub. Absolutely immoral and criminal society. This is what it is like to live under a fanatical religious extremism bent on international and domestic terrorist violence. You cannot peaceably exercise your constitutional rights or publicly protest without some repub ignorant hick revving their engine at you like some Charlottesville neo-Nazi gonna run you over. Filthy, dirty, diseased, spoiled, overgrown children who can't cover their mouths when they cut off, can't wash their hands, can't give enough personal space. Boundary issues all the way to the Supreme Courts, the Supreme Corruptions. I remember back in uh, when Obama won from Bush, there was a, a, a gif floating through the internet. Uh, uh, there's Bush and he takes off his face and there's a death skull and he puts on Obama's face. And, and I didn't really get that. But then Obama slicked through the remote control airplane assassination program. It's like a, the meanest kid in the playground. Who is anti-fascist? All World War I veterans, all World War II veterans, U.S. service veterans are anti-fascist, fighting on the side of democratic elections. Let me say this. When my dad, my real biological dad, was born in 1906, and when he was my age, 45 years old, Israel was just three years old. My dad was Ojibwe Anishinaabe, Native American Indian professor of American history. Like we wouldn't know where we come from. Let me say this, Israel is not Judaism. Judaism is not Israel. To be critical of the Israel state, to be critical of the Israeli state is not anti-Semitic. In the six day war, the Arab Israeli war, Israel blew up the USS Liberty United States spy ship and all of the records of the war crimes that expanded Israeli state territory. America gave almost all the weapons for that, so interwoven now. How is Israel not the 51st state? The Dems want to techno whiz fix out of the climate crisis. We need half of everybody to stop driving and start growing food. It is possible half of everyone in India are farmers, the theocracy of Western Christian nations and the theocracy of Israel and the theocracy of the Islamic nations is a collective Abrahamic theocracy of monotheism. What is really just a reflection of the grand alpha primate pyramid scheme of fascist authoritarianism. It is oppressive and undemocratic. There are other ways of thinking and being. So how are we going to get ourselves elected or installed as leaders of these violent organizations? Pledge allegiance to monotheism or be declared un-American, though that falsehood is itself an un-American Ponzi scheme cult. 
If you think that Kool-Aid, then you drink that Kool-Aid. That Kool-Aid is industrial and petrochemical pollution, toxic water, and crap food. Crap food. The way out is food sovereignty. Grow and raise and make your own. Make food for others if you can. So when did America stop being a racist terrorist apartheid theocracy for property owning European descendant men in principle? The Declaration of Independence was a historic monotheistic document, not a legal document. In 1791, the Bill of Rights was the legal document that officially overthrew monotheism for the United States of America. Amendment one, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise, the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. That is for the people and not the officials of the US government acting in their official capacity. When the chump T rump declared himself the chosen one, he was in violation of the US constitution. Again, unfit and not legit, unfit and not legit, and impeached twice. When Ashcroft and Pompeo were being religious nut jobs on the job, it hurt us all. I am so tired of the status quo where holding a badge or an official US office is treated as a de facto license to kill, murdering with impunity, roving executioners. I am so tired of American politicians stating falsely what Americans think and feel. Remember, Hillary Clinton publicly stated she wanted Ralph Nader shot, assassinated with a bullet. Did Trump T. Rump publicly state that Joseph R. Biden Jr. should be shot? Well, that was the implication when he sent his criminal mob to the U.S. Capitol. Cut from the same violent criminal cloth, the corporate party of industrial corruption. Why is the religious oppression of the Dems and the Repubs so important? important to address as opposed to the many other forms of oppression because when there is only one way their way to think and people are convinced to literally interpret the bible that the billions of years of earth's history evident in nature that science has elucidated are numbingly condensed into a mythical magical moment of creation and human history is considered no more than six thousand years of who beget whom well then the American populace is reduced to an idiotic, believing QAnon anything. Funding religious extremists, extremism is a major root of idiocy and falsehood abusing power. Middle Eastern and global crusades and the decades of war which have been going on most of my life. And that is why we must oppose democratic, dogmatic, dogmatic theocracy. Religious extremism is not benign. It is virulent culture, and we are better than that. Please consider this. If a person thinks there is really, there really only exists the individual human being, the, a singular soul, and then the greatest reality of existence, the monotheistic formation formulation of divinity, then what is missed is everything in between and everything else of relativistic existence. And all that diversity, all that diversity multitude of life with fuller existence needs to be perceived and acknowledged and honored and aligned to. That is the grounding that supports healthy life. Acknowledging all this is the cultural, is a cultural peace treaty between the forces of nature and the forces of humanity. It is my sincere hope we can achieve this and a sustainable, healthy future on planet Earth for all us all and for the future generations for posterity. Team Ikwich. Thank you, Joe Nathan. That was powerful. Um, okay, so uh, we're now past 420 and um you know thanks everyone for sticking it out uh here in madison at least it's been a beautiful day so <laughs> uh special appreciation for everyone who's uh you know stuck with us for the long meeting today and yeah thanks to all of our guests 
Uh, we had so many great conversations. Um, we were able to record things so that folks who weren't able to be here today, uh, you know, can still benefit from this. And um, yeah, and as always, of course, let's stay in touch. Let's continue building the party. Um, let's keep following up. Let's keep reaching out. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for being a part of it. And uh, we'll see you all soon. And have a great weekend. Green and growing. Green and growing. That's it. Go green. See you, everyone. Night. So I'll, I'll stop the stream in a second, but. So Dave, uh, Patty and I are planning to meet tomorrow morning. She will, she just wants to work out some details on the voter list. Okay. And then yeah. so tomorrow at nine, and then and then uh, I think she's relatively free, but uh, we should meet with you then, the three of us probably, right? Yeah. Then, then you can take the the list, and you know, I mean, there could there's not enough time. I mean, we we all need a break. I need to go outside, but I don't know if anyone like got. Uh, okay, I'm gonna throttle myself. That was my main the main thing that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, actually, actually, fun. I could definitely use a break too, and um, yeah, I think. If we have it ready by tomorrow morning, that's fine. Oh, you know, Alex should uncloak and say hello. He he's done some interesting activism. <laughs> I mean, I I might hang out and if he wants to talk. <laughs> but um, I should stop the um, I should stop the live stream. So, let oh me, yeah, let, let me do that, and uh, then I'll resurface again here yeah I, I noticed a few folks from stevens point and uh justin sice you know had to work today but he's also in point and yeah you know feels like we could definitely get something going there so Al alex is very experienced with facebook and all kinds of social media um and doing creating um I don't want to call them. Well, they're like throwaway accounts, you know, to go in there and be an effective activist and without necessarily um, disclosing your identity, but, you know, as a force for good. All right, let's see.